I'd like to welcome you all here this morning on behalf of everyone at Blue Valley Telecommunications. I am Terry Force, President of the Board of Directors for Blue Valley Telecommunications, and I'm also currently serving as President of NTCA, the Rural Broadband Association. A couple of housekeeping details to start with. Uh, we, we won't take a break till about noon, uh, but if you need to use the facilities, they're down the hall to your left. And I know we all have one of these. I know they're tough to turn off. But if you'd at least put them on silent, well, I would appreciate that. So thank you very much. I didn't know how to get started on this uh, opening remarks this morning, but I knew there'd be kind of a diverse group here. So I thought I'd start with a little bit of history of rural telecommunications as well as uh, Blue Valley itself. So uh, after going to the websites of NTCA and Blue Valley, I kind of came up with the following here. So uh, the independent telephone industry began to develop throughout rural America as early as the 1890s. After publication of a manual that explained to farmers how they could develop their own telephone system on a mutual or cooperative basis, many farmer mutual systems emerged throughout rural America. By 1912, the number of rural telephone systems had grown to more than 3,200. The number of farmer lines continued to increase after World War I. At its high point in 1927, the rural telephone industry included some 6,000 mutual systems and other organizations. But during the same period, these systems were deteriorating. The 1930s brought about Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal, which included the Federal Communications Commission, and the Communications Act of 1934 was created. The act made the concept of universal service the law of the land. The goal of universal service was, and remains today, to ensure that all Americans, regardless of where they live, receive quality telephone service at reasonable rates. Congress reaffirmed the nation's commitment to the policy and social value of universal service in passing the landmark Telecommunications Act of 1996. In late 1944, a bill was introduced in the U.S. Senate to establish a rural telephone administration modeled after the already successful Rural Electrific Electrification Administration. Action finally came in 1949 on bills to amend the Rural Electrification Act, making long-term, low-interest loans available to rural telephone systems. The availability of low-interest loans sparked a new era of growth for rural telephony, which continues today. More importantly, the availability of high-quality telephone service at reasonable rates improved the quality of life for millions of rural Americans. Now, some of the history of Blue Valley Telecommunications. Blue Valley Telephone Company was incorporated on May 23, 1956. In early 1960, Centralia Telephone Company, Home Telephone Company, Okito Mutual Telephone Company, Summerfield Mutual Telephone Company, Vermilion Telephone, and Force Telephone Exchange from Wheaton were acquired. In December of 1961, the Axtell Telephone Company and Vliet's Mutual Telephone Company were added. Eight companies were consolidated into seven exchanges and were provided with dial telephone service. In 1970, Farmers Mutual Telephone Company of Beatty was acquired and Palmer Telephone Company was purchased in 1974. In April of 1978, a sales agreement was signed that allowed the acquisition of the Lynn Rural Telephone Company. At the annual meeting in 2001, the patrons of Blue Valley Telephone voted to change the name of the company to reflect our more diverse service offerings. The new name of the 45-year-old patron-owned company will be known as Blue Valley Telecommunications Incorporated. In 2002, Blue Valley began offering wireless high-speed internet in the town of Marysville. We have now branched out and offered a variety of services to include the towns of Washington, Hanover, Waterville, Frankfurt, Blue Rapids, and Bremen. In 2005, we acquired the Onega and Westmoreland exchanges. BVTC made history by putting fiber to the home in these two exchanges both to the city subscribers as well as the rural subscribers. Shortly after the acquisition of Onega and Westmoreland, Blue Valley started offering internet protocol television, and thus BVTV was born. The next project Blue Valley undertook was offering the fiber to the home services to the rest of the 10 exchanges and are presently running on this most up-to-date technology. We are currently in the middle of an electronics upgrade to our 12 exchanges to offer even higher internet speeds with the capability of offering even yet to be determined technologies to our patrons. Recently, we had the opportunity to uh, visit and see the uh, uh, documentary named Farmland. Uh, I know I don't think it's out yet for, 
for uh, on the big screen or PBS or wherever it's going to be. But ladies and gentlemen, if you ever get a chance to see this documentary of farmland, it's well worth your time. It's a documentary chronicling the lives and day-to-day -day issues of six young agriculture professionals. The film really made an impression on me as to how much the broadband technology is being utilized by the agriculture community today. Of course, they all had cell phones, whether to communicate with their employees or to check prices or to check on availability of products and services needed that day, and not to mention checking on the weather. Another thing that stood out to me was the use of tablets for a, a wide variety of uses. And one of the stories out of that documentary really struck home with me and made an impression was the fact that uh, one of the young men was uh, telling about the fact when he used to go get ready to plant, they'd just go to the, go to the shed, uh, hook up the planter, tighten the belts, and tighten the chains, and grease it up, and away they go. But he was telling a story just lately. He had to wait four hours for a um, software update to be downloaded to the planter. And we all know in the agriculture industry, four hours is sometimes a huge amount of time. So that's uh, you know, one of those reasons maybe we're here trying to figure out what we can do. So why are we here today? You know, I'd like to have you direct your attention to the back of the room. That poster, that billboard, you see them along the Kansas highways. And that, that, I've seen it for several years, and that's always made a tremendous impact on me. Uh, when it says, you know, one Kansas farmer feeds 155 people and you, why well, that just really struck home to me. That's why we're here today, folks. Well, that's why we're here today. These billboards are placed along major highways throughout Kansas by the Kansas Agri-Women's Group and sponsored by farmtime.com. So whether our mission as a broadband provider is to offer higher speeds or more bandwidths for data transfer or to provide adequate data storage, or anything in between, that is what we're going to try to find out here today. So how can we, so how can we as broadband providers help the agriculture industry? That's what we're doing here today. So now let's get on with the program. I'd like to introduce a man that probably doesn't need any introduction, but he might have come up with his own introduction when he gets up here, but uh, I would like to welcome to the stage the Honorable Senator Pat Roberts. Dallas Lee, Dallas Lee, one of the, uh, of the best introductions I've ever had, so <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. Thank you, uh, and good morning. That's pretty pathetic. Uh, good, morning. good morning. I appreciate that. If you don't really sound off and get to the bottom of some of the problems that we have in the country and to keep our folks informed why you're sentenced to go outside for about 15 minutes. It's like Merry Christmas out there. I don't know what happened to spring, but at uh, any rate, if you don't like uh, the weather in Kansas, you just have to wait a little bit. Uh, I really appreciate uh, you allowing me to join you today, and more especially uh, all the frank advice and counsel that you provide. Uh, whether you are in the District of Columbia at our nation's capital when you uh, get the opportunity to come back, but more especially back here at home when I'm honored to join you at events like this. Uh, my staff and I really depend on you to keep us informed. We have several staff here, and uh, I want to really thank you for that partnership. Uh, let's go to the good news first. It's not often in Washington you can come back home and say we've got good news, but we really do. Uh, last week, after almost a decade of uncertainty, a decade of uncertainty, uh, the President signed into law the Rural Cooperative Pension Bill. So we got that one done. That ought to get a little applause, I think. There's an awful lot of people. And you're really applauding for yourself. There's a lot of us been working on this for some time, but you have uh, certainly shown us the way. Since 2006, uh, Congress has recognized the unique structures of your pension plans. And rather than sweep all the plans together, uh, this new law enacts permanent rules to ensure the strength and the uh, uh, sustainability of your pension plans so that you can all continue to provide the needed services 
to our uh, rural communities. Uh, hopefully we have provided peace of uh, mind and thank you so much for your help. And I thank you all for your partnership in helping to get this important legislation past the finish line. Now, regarding telecom in the future, a few issues today are more important to the economic viability and uh, sustainable growth in rural America than the continued deployment of broadband through all out our rural communities. The Universal Service Fund has supported the deployment of telephone and broadband access to rural areas and allowed our state's residents, no matter where they live, to enjoy the expansion of the Internet. And it's been all of you folks sitting in this room today who have taken it upon yourselves to invest billions of dollars in Kansas to build out broadbands to parts of our state necessary to ensure that our farmers, our hospitals, our schools, all of our businesses are not falling behind the rest of the country. You have all made these investments, uh, relying on express language in the Telecom Act, which requires universal service to be sufficient and predictable. Just think about those words, sufficient and uh, predictable. They are a promise, if you will, a promise to be kept, a promise that must ensure short-term politics won't impact long-term investments a problem we have in our nation's capital. The Rural Utility Service, a branch of the Department of Agriculture, certainly thought so, and that's why it kept making long-term loans for rural broadband, and the RS thought the Federal Communications Commission would stick to the federal pledge of sufficiency and predictability, the FCC. But then at the end of 2011, just a couple of years ago, the FCC adopted the Universal Service Fund Transformation Order, hard to say. While there is much about the USF that needs work, I think we all agree on that, what we don't believe makes sense is imposing radically arbitrary caps known infamously, are you ready for this, quantile regression analysis. That sounds like something the Fish and Game Department would put on the lesser prairie chicken. Uh, <laughs> quantile regression analysis on the payments needed to support the investments you have all made to connect all of Kansas. Uh, this counterproductive and downright foolish proposal placed many of your businesses at risk, specifically as it pertains to your ability to pay back loans guaranteed by U.S. taxpayers because of a unilateral decision made by an independent agency. Uh, where have we heard this story before with this administration? I think and I hope you would agree it is reasonable and imperative to ask that we should honor the laws that have been passed and the laws by which we require Americans to live by. I was proud to join my Senate colleagues in sending quite a few letters over to the past two and a half years to the FCC, it takes about that long, asking that as the reform of the USF moves forward, the FCC implement a payment support system that honors the commitment made to you all clear back in 1996. Now, more good news. The squeaky wheel does get the grease on, a, uh, on occasion. The FCC has heeded our request. Thankfully, the new commissioner, Tom Wheeler, has asked his staff, and he came to visit with us, and I think he's a reasonable fellow, to throw out the quantile regression analysis, thank goodness. The acronym for that, by the way, is QRA. I'm sure you could think up something else that that means, but we are going to get rid of it, hopefully, and come up with a new support mechanism to provide you with all of the predictable and sufficient funding necessary to fulfill the goals of true universal service. Now, what the new payment system will look like, what we don't know, but what we will know, and what we'll make, what we will make damn sure works in working with all of you and the FCC to find a solution, uh, we are going to protect the interest of our state's uh, rural providers. I want to thank you all again for your continued commitment to providing a critically essential service for our state's economy. As long as I have the privilege of serving in the United States Senate, I will continue to stand by your side. I got your back to make sure that the FCC is responsive to your concerns. Thank you so much for having me. You have a great lineup here uh, with regards to the importance, oh, that's what I did, uh, 
at 1015, you've got an agriculture and broadband uh, presentation, then you've got great panel discussions, uh, a delicious Bach lunch with roundtable discussions and a roundtable recap. So without taking any more of your time, thank you so much. We have made some progress in your behalf in Washington. It's a difficult time to do that uh, in Washington, but uh, I have a card here somewhere that I wanted to read to you. I know that so many folks as I travel the state and we're on our 105 county listening tour and we're closing in on 105, but uh, we just visited uh, the Cook Manufacturing folks down here and uh, we were going down what happens when a, a particular federal agency comes in and basically what they do is they say if you don't pay the fine, we'll double the fine and we'll take you to court. Now folks, this is the kind of attitude and the kind of situation that we find too much in Washington with all of the agencies that uh, are handing out what I consider to be regulatory, um, uh, just way over regulation and I can't go to any meeting without somebody complaining about some regulation that is counterproductive or about to put people out of business. That's not the way this is supposed to be. Government's supposed to be not an adversary, they're supposed to be a partner to enable you to do things. And so we're trying to go to targeted meetings like that and then come to folks like yourself who are doing such a great job. But there's a feeling out there, a palpable fear, uh, that America that we have known and we have prospered in, loved, felt very uh, privileged to be uh, in this exceptional country, will not be the America for our kids and grandkids. And that's, that's, that's something that needs to be changed. Kansas has a motto said, uh, to the stars through difficulty. And I think that uh, we'll be just fine if the government can uh, at least back off a little bit. And I wanted to meet or read something to you here from Dwight Eisenhower. Well, number one, Winston Churchill said, kites rise highest against the wind, not with it. Something to think about. Everybody here has done that with, with regards to their career. I know Don has, and, uh, and, we, and we've been working with him for an awful long time. There is nothing wrong with America that the faith, love of freedom, and intelligence and energy of our citizens cannot cure. Dwight David Eisenhower. That's a good thing to end on. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator. We appreciate your words. Now we'll move right in with the agriculture and broadband presentations. Uh, I would like to direct you to the, uh, the, their bios in the handout so we don't, won't be going over their bios in the interest of time. But now I'd like to uh, have come up to the stage here Dr. Dan Thompson, Dr. Joel DeRushi, Jerry Horton, and Jada Ackerman. Hi there, I'm Dr. Dan Thompson. Thanks for uh, having me. I'm at the uh, College of Veterinary Medicine and also the uh, director of the Beef Cattle Institute at Kansas State University. I see a lot of familiar faces. Uh, I live in Riley, Kansas. But when you start thinking about broadband and you start thinking about rural America, I was raised about 150 miles as the crow flies in southwest Iowa. My uh, dad and grandpa, my grandpa started our veterinary clinic in 1938. My dad joined it in 1967. And, um, Veterinary medicine and serving rural America has been a part of our life. I graduated in a high school class of eight. Four guys and four girls is a pretty small prom. But um, <laughs> we had more teachers and their uh, spouses there than we did kids with their dates. But, uh, you know, serving rural America is the reason why I quit veterinary practice and uh, joined Kansas State University about a decade ago. I had a private practice in Amarillo, Texas moved my wife and four daughters to Riley, Kansas, so we spend a lot of time in this Marysville home area uh, with sports. But, you know, we start to think about why do people move out of rural America and why do they head to urban and suburban areas, and, and part of it is what we're discussing today. It's the opportunities, it's the education. I taught a few months ago at Olathe North High School, uh, their culinary institute, and different things that we could be offering our students here in rural Kansas 
and, and the educational opportunities, whether it's getting a head start, not everybody needs to go to college. There are technical degrees and things to that nature that we can be op making opportunities uh, for our schools. And I probably forgot to mention I'm on the school board at Riley County, uh, USD 378 as well. So we tackle these every day. But when you start to think about job development and the ability to not only bring information in to rural Kansas, but the ability for hardworking Kansas that live in rural America to be able to start businesses and, and promote business outside of, of here, education, entertainment. But when business opportunities and things that we're looking at, risk avoidance, uh, productivity enhancements within farming and animal agriculture, human health advancements and, and telemedicine and, and animal medicine advancements are going to be huge as we, as we move forward access to markets and and we're going to bring many things to to rural america but uh you know some of the things that that broadband has done in our program or would do in our program is we develop audio visual training tools for for agriculture at the beef cattle institute and we've developed about seven to eight hundred hours of content in five to ten minute videos in multiple languages because when you start to look at the education and the the language of preference of people in agriculture, we have to include multiple languages to get the job done. You know, you learn very much, very little from a lecture. You learn 70% of what you knowledge you've gained in life from difficult work. And in between lectures and difficult work is audiovisual uh, and, and, and the ability to, to get the job done. Well, I was a practitioner. I was at our feeding facilities once a month. And I thought, well, who's doing the training the other 29 days? And so we started to develop these training tools in, in uh, uh, and we're also doing telemedicine with practitioners in Western Kansas where we can see cases, where we can see necropsies, or we can see uh, farm animal cases. When we start to talk about disease security and biosecurity, these are going to be big things. We have started the animal care training mechanism and, and training tool at Kansas State University through the Beef Cattle Institute. We just signed a contract with McDonald's to serve people who are going to touch animals that will wind up being McDonald's hamburgers. And so every person that is going to be taking care of cattle globally, the 331 beef packing plants that supply McDonald's internationally will all be taking the training from Manhattan, Kansas and Kansas State University. We've done this in five different languages, Portuguese, French, German, uh, Spanish, and English. We have a contract with the National Cattlemen's Beef Association to supply beef quality assurance training online. And over the last four weeks, we have had 6,500 beef producers across the United States register and sign up uh, for that. We serve online training for animal welfare, food safety, and environmental stewardship. We also work with the Livestock Marketing Association to supply training for their 800 sale barns and there are 35 million cattle that go through those facilities each year. We have uh, different contracts with USDA, but more recently we've started a television show, if you've seen it, called Doc Talk uh, or Ag AM in Kansas. These are two shows. One of them is local, uh, Ag AM in Kansas, which shows five days a week across all the state. And then Doc Talk is a show that I host that is on RFD TV that is national, and it brings solutions or real life problems back to the to the producer we're going to talk a lot about america's uh you know about the impact of agriculture on america we're going to talk about things that we could bring to rural america and tools that we need to have accessible but the one thing when i look at our country today and i spend a lot of time with a lot of talks and speaking to a lot of different groups whether it's outside of agriculture or inside of agriculture and i agree with you farmland is a remarkable movie and I appreciate the opportunity to be here today and I hope to continue to work with you but I probably think when you look at engagement and you look at extension communication is not a one-way street we have to give and we have to take and we're going to talk a lot about what we can bring to rural America but probably the most important thing that I see of living in a rural America and see the problems that we have in our country they say a person whose belly's half full has many problems, and a person who's starving's got but one. We should feel pretty lucky in this country to have the problems that we have, and we're miserable. Okay? And I think that being able to take rural America to the urban areas 
might be the biggest thing that broadband coming out into this part of the country and showing people how we in rural America live a faith-based life and an opportunity to promote the way that we solve problems through hard work and humility and get things back on track. Thank you. Well, good, good morning. My name is Joel DeRushi. I work at Kansas State University uh, in the Animal Science Department. Um, I'm involved with a number of different activities, and I'm going to talk specifically more in my role on the extension side, uh, which was founded, for those that aren't for, as familiar with our university extension, it was through the Smith-Lever Act of 1914 where extension service was developed at a federal level and then brought back to our land-grant universities in Kansas State here in Kansas is our land-grant university that then provides that system. In Kansas we have a strong network throughout the counties. Uh, Susie Latta who's here is in uh, one of our uh, extension uh, agents here in, in Marshall County. We have them in each of our county seats and we provide services outside of AG to all the different areas through uh, obviously 4-H is probably as recognizable but through all of our different areas and I guess the, the, the message I want to bring today is really uh, obviously with AG today but as we think of getting information to our clients, local uh, families, um, local businesses, local producers uh, throughout Kansas. I grew up in South Dakota, small community, Pakwana, uh, 200 people um, and I think back in this last year was my 20 year class reunion and so nothing like going back, I was feeling pretty old going back to a 20 year reunion and for some reason they had me moderate, I guess they think I have a, a gab a little bit and so I tell you what, going back I felt pretty young though because the 20 years we were still in the back row and I think of it as we look at the development of how we get information. My parents uh, in, were involved in the livestock industry. That was my uh, upbringing and, and, and now I'm able to serve producers. My dad is in the purebred, uh, purebred seed stock business and he was one of the first producers that I know of and anybody who has, I know we're, we have a very wide variety of audiences, those that uh, sell a lot of their cattle through videos. Okay, Right now in the livestock side there's a lot of videos that occur. My dad was one of the first in South Dakota to start that. The big problem was it was really nice in concept and then we post videos 15, 20 years ago and how do you fast do you think that worked okay so we're, we've made improvements I'd like to thank all of you in the room that, that are part of this and very important industry for rural America in, in getting improved internet access internet speed but we still have a long way to go if you think about our producers the amount of sophistication I'm going to specifically talk on our ag producers the level of sophistication that our producers employ today it's absolutely amazing. I know for many of you that do work, but I know many of you don't work on a daily basis with producers. The amount of risk and dollars involved today absolutely dwarf of where we were 10 to 20 years ago. If you think about a bag of seed corn, today it's going to cost 300 to 325 bucks for most seed corn. We'd go back even five years, it was around 200, and if we want to go historical, what it cost. For a baby pigs, I think the Schwartz is representative Sharon and Leo Schwartz, a great farm family involved with swine production a number of years, had the pleasure to work with them. A baby pig today, weaned, we wean baby pigs at 21 days of age, that pig today is worth about $80, all right? Go back five years, it was worth about $30. The amount of risk that our producers are inheriting on an input basis, we can go through all of our livestock, uh, species, agronomy, is absolutely massive. And the reward on the other side isn't always there. Obviously, that's why we have the risks involved. How do we get information? How do we get unbiased information that our extension and others provide to make sure producers can do a good job in, in their individual decisions? And that's a challenge we have. It seems like education should be pushing producers rather than trying to catch up. And oftentimes, we do that with many producers. But I'll tell you what, there's many producers out front of us in the education side solely due to our ability to get them timely information. We oftentimes have the information. We just can't get it to everybody that we want to in the timely fashion. Back to face-to-face -to -face is great. That's why we're here. It's, you know, could have this been a complete virtual meeting? Probably. But the face-to-face, -face, nothing replaces sometimes. But we've got to come really close getting information out over the web and through live streaming and videos. One of the challenges we run into on the education side, there's several examples. I'm involved in a 10-state swine educational program involving 10 land grants across the country. Uh, we try, 
we're back to the way we operate that is we have to make have the presenter send in the presentation a month ahead of time we burn it on CDs we send it out to all the farms and then we do a phone bridge because we can't have a quality presentation done live in a lot of the places that our farms are where are most swine farms today, if we were to go build a swine farm, where are most of those swine farms going to be built? They can be built right next to town, or are they going to be out in a more remote location? We're going to move them out, okay, for a variety of reasons. Well, what happens then when we have multi-million dollar operations that are in business, in production, we have them in the most remote areas because especially biosecurity to keep diseases out, we want to let, decrease traffic, but also just for the security of having it in a remote area. We lose the ability to get them information. And that's a consequence. And when we have these multi-million dollar businesses that operate continually and support the local economy back in town, how do we make sure they're getting the information they need? This is certainly a way we got to catch up to provide those producers that information. Another good example is with, with uh, different diseases that come out. And this can go across all crops, uh, livestock, but just some good examples recently. Our swine industry is going through a disease called PED, porcine epidemic diarrhea. Doesn't sound very good, and it's not. It basically got introduced last year from China, um, and over about, they estimated probably 60% of the U.S. herds have been impacted by it. If you, if you, it's been in the news, it's been on several of the stations, it's a, it's a big deal. Basically, every baby pig that a sow has, once they get exposed, every, uh, for three weeks, every pig will die when they're babies, okay? You can imagine, because this disease spreads very easily, do you think a lot of producers want to come to a central spot and get information and be around other producers? No, we need to provide this at home, real time, real information. And we do the best we can through YouTube videos, direct phone messages, all those things. But we're missing out on a lot of experts around the world or experts Kansas can provide to other states because we don't have the full ability to have quality and dependable um, ways to do our meetings uh, virtually. We've tried many times and we're back to phone bridges and um, CDs and those sort of things to get information out. And so to help our rural producers who are the, I mean, you think about the amount of dollars they spend in the local communities, we got to help advance them. This is one of the ways that we can do that. Um, so I guess I leave that as a challenge for many of you in this room. How do we partner? How do we provide that? How do we continue to build that? Um, even in, even in our vibrant communities, we still struggle with that at times. And so how do we can continue to build that uh, to help our producers and help advance the egg uh, sector, which is so vital and represents the majority of dollars in our rural communities, helping those producers. And that's who I'm passionate about. That's who I help every day. And so that's kind of the message I wanted to leave with you here today. And we can have more discussion as part of panels and other discussion later this afternoon. Thank you for attending. Some of us are not that tall. Well, I'm Jerry Horton, and I am the uh, <coughs> CEO and IT and video supervisor here at Blue Valley Telecommunications. Uh, I'm Kansas born and bred, uh, lived most of my life in Kansas and all of it in the Midwest. Uh, I've spent the bulk of my uh, working career in telecommunications, but I've also done healthcare. Uh, agriculture is where I started, uh, uh, agriculture informatics uh, specifically, and I'll get into that here in a second, and uh, also banking and just about every other industry, just like all of us do around here. My experience with ag agriculture came right after I got out of uh, uh, tech school, and I immediately went into uh, uh, the measurement technology industry which uh, was uh, basically feed truck scales. And uh, uh, that's real mobility right there. Not a lot of bandwidth, but real mobility. Um, did a lot of stuff in uh, packing plants uh, uh, with uh, scales and did a lot of uh, stuff with uh, writing programming for uh, the feed industry. So I've been around agriculture for a long time and seen the, the growth of information technology and informatics. Um, according to the USDA Census of Agriculture in 1997, yes, it's dated, is the earliest or the latest I could find, there are 1.9 million farms in the United States. Over 69% of those farms 
have livestock as well. Now, if you compare that to the average broadband usage in the United States currently, and this is, uh, this is information from this month, 86% of all people between 18 and 65 use the internet, and generally that's broadband. 59% uh, of 65 and older also use that. I'm going to say that those numbers are pretty applicable to farming, even though, as Dr. DeRussi pointed out, there are a lot of uh, industries where maybe necessarily broadband, as uh, telecommunications generally thinks of it, is not truly available. So what we've had over the last several years is this gigantic explosion of technology over into, into agriculture. Uh, I can remember when, uh, uh, I first installed a scale on a gr uh, grain cart. That was a huge deal. Nobody had ev ever even thought of it before. And needless to say, the first couple of experiments didn't work all that well. It just, the grain cart wasn't engineered well for it. But in advance of that, then we've had GPS where basically you drive your tractor or your combine with an iPad. We have monitoring not only of the equipment but of also of the plants and GIS has been a major component of all of this. And this has been steadily growing with uh, increasing rapidity over the last 20 years or so. The problem is that all of the data from all of these systems is in great big silos. We have a four hour download for a tractor or a planter over here and then we've got data coming in from, oh, okay, I've used this much feed over the last year, or here's my fuel cost, and here's uh, what it costs to run an irrigation engine. All of, this, all of this information is just scattered all over the place. Uh, many tractors and combines already use GPS satellites, and just to plant ever straighter rows, while farmers, freed from steering, Monitor progress on iPads or other tablet computers, now common in tractor cabs. The same machinery collects data on crops and soil, but many farmers have haphazardly managed the information, scattered in piles of paperwork in their office, or stored in thumb drives clattering around in pickup ashtrays. The data were turned over by hand for piecemeal analysis, and that's the point I want to get to. Where we're at with agriculture is we're on the cusp of an industry buzzword called big data, something that Google and Amazon have used for years. Data gathered from tons of different sources, collated and actually used to create decisions, good business and marketing decisions. Kenneth Kukier, who was uh, the author of Big Data, a revolution that will transform how we live, work, and think, defined big data as the collecting and applying of data in ways we never have before. The implications of big data are that we can also take this gargantuan amount of data and now apply it to problems we never could before. This quantitative shift leads us to a qualitative shift. More is not more. It's different. Now, the seed companies and the manufacturers, various, uh, various vendors, have jumped on this bandwagon early because they've been in the big data business for a very, very, very long time. Monsanto, for instance, has a data-driven planning advice that they can give to farmers. It could increase worldwide prop, crop production by about $20 billion per year, or about one-third the value of last year's U.S. crop. The technology could help improve the average corn harvest to more than 200 bushels an acre, from the current 160 uh, bushels an acre, companies say. <clears throat> Such a gain would generate an extra $182 per acre in revenue for farmers. Big data puts augmented reality at our disposal. We need the tools and technology that computerization has brought to agriculture to be able to profitably drive production and marketing decisions. Now, there are commercial solutions available. Monsanto, DuPont, John Deere. What's the problem with that? Well, the problem is, is who owns the data? That is the core and central problem to all of this. 
even though the, uh, the GIS data, the crop data, the livestock data that each farmer generates is out there somewhere, the vendor actually has direct control of it. The farmer does not. Former Undersecretary of Agriculture Bruce Knight wrote, Increasingly specific data is available today on almost every plot of arable land in the U.S. It's out there in one data bank or another. But who does it belong to? Blake Hurst wrote in The American, the individual farmer's data has considerably more value than the average consumer's data. Many farms are fairly large businesses, spending hundreds of thousands on fertilizer and seed and producing millions of dollars in crops. It's not difficult to imagine a smartphone ad arriving within seconds of a farmer encountering weed or insect damage while he's harvesting his crop. Farmer's information is valuable to the companies sponsoring the ads. So farmers should be compensated when their data is sold. Farmers need to protect their data and make sure they bargain wisely as they share data with suppliers and companies who desire access to their information. We've all seen it. How many of you have a Gmail address? Probably the vast majority of you have Gmail or Yahoo or Hotmail. The ads that are derived from that are derived from big data. And by the way, when you sign into that system, suddenly all the email that you type on there doesn't belong to you. It actually belongs to Google or Yahoo or Microsoft. That's why they can sell your data without your permission. Farmers have a much more unique uh, uh, and opportunity, really. The problem is that there's no cost-effective solution for the individual farmer. For one thing, the transport uh, for most of the remote devices largely is uh, cellular data. Cellular data is not as fast as, as uh, wired data, for one thing, although that technology is kind of bouncing back and forth right now, and it's very expensive. Uh, just yesterday, I went and uh, talked to Verizon, and uh, basically, uh, if I got a Verizon home router for 10 gigabytes of data, that would cost me $100 a month. Now, that doesn't sound like much until you realize that uh, you stream a few YouTube videos, you download this, you download that, 10 gigabytes is gone like that, and it's $15 a gigabyte after that. So. Cellular data is not necessarily, our, or satellite data, are not necessarily what we need to be looking at. The other part is data collection. The data collection is largely done by third-party commercial services who have a vested interest in the data itself. Last year, farmers paid about $118 uh, uh, an acre for seed corn, up 166% from the inflation-adjusted cost of $45 an acre in 2005. That comes from estimates uh, and by a study done by Purdue University. So they're not necessarily using this data to raise the price, but as Dr. Darushi pointed out, we have an increased uh, risk uh, factor and the costs are not going anywhere. Who, where's the data secured at? Who's securing it? Who do you give the release for that data to? Is it just because you signed up for some, somebody something and it's in the fine print down in the bottom? And how do you take that data that is useful primarily to you, not just to the vendor, how do you take that data and actually share it with other vendors that you might need to share it with? And what subset of that data do they need? How do we retrieve the data if you suddenly decide not to use the XYZ service anymore? Do you just lose it and you have to recreate it from scratch? Studies show that any business who does not regularly back up their data within 18, 24 months of uh, catastrophic failure that uh, leads to data loss, well, guess what? They're out of business. Farmers can't afford that and neither can America. There is no standardized format for this. The conclusion that we should draw from this is that we need partnerships. Rural telecommunications have the transport and the IT knowledge to build solutions for a private ag cloud. Universities 
have uh, the research and software development capability as well as education capabilities. Vendors have the financial wherewithal and a vested interest. The goal really here is a cost-effective private solution that ensures the farmer and rancher is the data owner while giving the vendors controlled access. Thanks and have a great one. I think you're the only one, Jerry. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I'm used to it by now. Hi, I am Jada Ackerman. And I grew up in the same small town that I am raising my children in. And I think from the time that I was old enough to remember, I've been paying attention to the small details in my community. I've always found myself noticing out-of-state license plates parked in front of stores, new faces that might be walking on the street, and um, new businesses that are popping up and even new products and services that are being offered in and around my community. I've always been intrigued by community development. I enjoy seeing my community benefit from hard work and dedication, from people pulling together towards a common goal, and then celebrating those successes and accomplishments. I also have a deep appreciation for change. I don't always like it, but I do appreciate it. I think, as we all can agree, sometimes change is good, and sometimes it can prevent cha or present challenges to us. But one thing is inevitable. Change is going to happen. And we can either embrace it and point it in the direction that we want it to go, or we can completely let it consume us and drop us where it may. My grandfather was born in 1917, and he was a second generation farmer. And back in those days, he went to school until fourth grade. By that point, he had learned the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. That was all he needed to know to go back home to that family farm to work the land. And that's exactly what my grandpa did until his passing in the early 90s. During that time, he saw a lot of changes, as I'm sure you can imagine, um, from starting out with horses and moving to tractors and, and plows. Um, to him, farming wasn't work. It was just a way of life. And um, he tried to instill that value into all of his children and grandchildren. And I think back to all those changes that he saw and I look at where our changes are going now, and I'm pretty sure he didn't see anything like we're seeing today. No longer is a fourth grade education acceptable. Um, our youth today are going out and earning two year, four year degrees, sometimes even masters, to come back home to work the land. So what's changed? I think an acceptable term is pretty much everything. Um, from us, we've changed. Our land has changed. Our needs have changed. And I believe that our advancements in technology are really helping to drive those changes. From smartphones and tablets to GPS units and RFID tags. It's no surprise that my grandfather's ways have become completely obsolete. Technology is impacting our rural communities in very positive ways. While we once fought with the outward migration of our youth, I think we're starting to see trends now of our youth coming back home. Um, I look back at my high school graduating class and 41% have moved back home to this area to raise their families. And I look at the employees and staff at Blue Valley Telecommunications right here and we're at 93% local. So that screams volumes to me about the value that we're placing on the quality of life. We recognize that and we want to share that and give that back to our families. And I believe that technology is playing a significant role in this. Jobs that we weren't able to do 10 years ago from rural America can now be done 
anywhere that we have a broadband connection. Educational opportunities that we once had to find in big schools are now being developed or de deployed to our rural classrooms via that broadband connection. Our local farmers and ranchers, they're also benefiting from these advancements. From our small hobby farmers to our full-time operations, they all have one thing in common, and that's broadband is aiding them in their efforts. I've heard time and time again from our hobby farmers that advancements in technology are enabling them to monitor their crops and their livestock. Um, they're able to buy and sell competitively at livestock auctions during their lunch hours. So that means that they don't have to give up that security of their eight to five income in order to do what they love. But I also hear from our full-time farmers um, that they're able to market their products and services globally. So that's helping them to stay on the farm and avoid having to go find that eight to five job. It's all thanks to broadband and our technological advancements. In September last year, Blue Valley, along with the communities that it serves, uh, was honored with the recognition of smart rural communities from NTCA, the Rural Broadband Association. This distinction highlights what we've done and what all of us here are doing today. We're building relationships and collaborating with one another in an effort to keep rural America moving forward. It's not just Blue Valley. It's about all of us. Blue Valley is one of the companies, just one of many companies throughout the United States who has a strong focus on communities. Many of us in this room were formed in an effort to instigate change and drive community economic development. That's what we're doing here today. That's why every one of us made the effort to drive here for just a few hours. We're all working to find ways to work together, to collaborate with one another, to form partnerships, to make rural America more efficient. So whether it's farming, ag, manufacturing, technology, we're all working hand in hand on this. I kind of think we're like a big puzzle. And if one of those pieces isn't in place, the picture is a little bit distorted. We've got technology empowering our farms and our manufacturing industries. Those industries provide jobs to our families who send their children to rural schools. Those rural schools depend on technology in order to provide the opportunities in the classrooms. We've got those people depending on our rural hospitals to provide health care. Those hospitals depend on technology to connect with larger hospitals in order to provide the services that they need um, to connect with specialists. Hospitals with advanced technology attract younger doctors. Younger doctors bring with them their families. And all of these people are, are purchasing services and goods from our local businesses and our local farms. If we take away one of those pieces of the puzzle, we risk several other pieces falling out. It's a team effort. Shopping locally, supporting our farms and businesses, and pursuing the development and deployment of technological advances is where it starts. And that's us right here today. It's the first step in accomplishing that. So, today we're going to meet and share ideas and concepts all for the sake of the future, but not our future, the future of generations to come. So that way, in 50 years, when children, are all grown up and they're standing here on a podium 
looking out to an audience of their peers, they can look back and say, wow, my grandparents saw a lot of change in their life. And they really pushed the development of technology and agriculture. But man, they haven't seen any changes like we're seeing today. Thank you guys for joining us. And I look forward to all the great discussion we'll have. All right. Fantastic information. Fantastic. We appreciate it very much. Now, uh, our next set of panel discussions, we'd like to have them come forward at this time. I'm going to introduce uh, Jessica Golden from NTCA, the Strategic Outreach Manager, and then she will introduce, in turn, introduce the uh, panelists coming up. So please come forward. Good morning, everybody. It's great to see everyone here. We have such a great range of folks in the audience. Um, as Terry said, my name is Jessica Golden, and I'm with NTCA, the Rural Broadband Association. So just to give you a quick idea of who NTCA is, in case there are folks here who aren't familiar with us, we're a national trade association representing about 900 small rural telephone cooperative and commercial companies throughout the United States. Our members serve about 5% of the nation's population, over 40% of the landmass. We are rural. So I'm, I'm honored to be here today because we have an incredible panel with us to talk about the increasing role of broadband-enabled technologies in our agricultural industries. And we had some great comments before. I think, Jada, I know you definitely inspired me with your thoughts, and everyone um, of the initial speakers was fantastic. And I think Senator Pat Roberts really gets what we're talking about. So that was also very good to hear, because back in Washington, it's not, it's not a good environment to be in right now. Um, we have a historic low of members of Congress from rural America. So events like this really do make a difference, because it's going to be these grassroots efforts that really do end up making the difference at the end of the day. So, I, I kind of want to step back and say, and I've talked to a lot of folks here about this before, but rural America is facing a great challenge right now of relevance, right? We're hearing folks talk about things like Honey Boo Boo and the Beverly Hillbillies. There are all these negative misconceptions out there about rural. So in addition to the regulatory uncertainty that we face as an industry, we're up against all these challenges that society is kind of putting on us, these negative misconceptions that rural is backwards, rural is lazy, rural is not cool. So today, one of the challenges that I have for us today is that we can mull over this. How do we go about combating this disconnect? And one of these disconnects, I think, is if you were to go up to a child in, a in an urban or suburban area today and ask them where their food comes from, who here thinks that they would say the farm? How about the grocery store? That's unfortunate. But that's something that I'd like to take as a positive challenge for us to change and make that disconnect disappear. So I think Terry Holdren put it best when I talked to him on the phone. He said that there are two kinds of growth we should be talking about today. On the one hand, there's the growth of the role of technology in broadband and agriculture. But also there's the growth of our rural communities. And I know Jada talked a little bit about that, that this, there's a trend of folks going away and then coming back into rural communities. And I think we need to be challenged to keep that trend alive and keep that trend going, right? Because without a, a healthy rural community and without healthy rural families, we won't have a sustainable, healthy rural agricultural economy. And that's something our nation depends on. It's not just our local communities. It's not just our state. But our nation depends on a healthy agricultural economy. So I think that's something we need to add to our nation's conversation. So has anyone here, had anyone here about, heard about the uh, Smart Rural Community Initiative before coming today? Good, excellent. We've got some folks in the audience who are very familiar with it, and it's, it's, a, it's a great initiative. And so just for a little bit of background, NTCA hosted a summit about two years ago where we brought together about 50 national leaders from agriculture, public safety, education, health care, and we asked them, what does broadband mean to you? What does broadband mean to your constituents in rural communities? Is it distance education initiatives, telemedicine, 
public safety, making sure there's inter interconnectivity between communities. Uh, yet about a year later, we decided we have some incredible members in rural communities who are showcasing incredibly innovative initiatives. They're taking, yes, they may be facing challenges of access and affordability, but they are going above and beyond in taking advantage of their networks, not just as a company, but as a community. And Blue Valley Telecommunications is one of these companies. So I wanted to definitely highlight them and give them a round of applause because they are one of our NTCA Smart Rural Community winners. So we're just so happy that I mean, I'm I back in Washington, I was talking about this event that's coming up in Kansas, and I'm going out to Kansas for the first time, but we're going to highlight our Smart Rural Community winner of Blue Valley. And I know mutual telephone companies here as well, so Jada, I mean, so I'm sorry. So I'm so glad that you could be here, Shayla, because honestly, it's, it's a group effort, and we're so glad to be able to highlight these positive initiatives to prove that, that rural can be cool. I've got my Rural is Cool bracelets on today, by the way. If anyone would like some, I have some with me. <laughs> I wear them proudly on our metro in Washington. In DC. <laughs> so again, uh, we at NTCA, and I think everyone in this room, believes that rural is relevant and that rural is cool. So hopefully, I don't want to take any more time because we have an incredible panel with us today, but I just want to keep that in mind and how we can go about, from a grassroots level, changing this perception of rural. And I think it's by events like this and by the Smart Rural Community Initiative that we can go about doing that. So with that, I'd like to introduce our panelists today, and I'll have each of you maybe say a few sentences about where you're coming from and what organization you're uh, focused on. Um, so we, I know we have Patty Clark from USDA, He's USDA State Director for the State of Kansas for Rural Development. And we have, um, let's see, Terry Holdren as well. <laughs> I'm sorry, Terry Holdren. I didn't get to meet the panelists beforehand, so I'm just going off of, of the, the name list. Apologize. Terry Holdren, we've got the, um, sorry, uh, CEO and General Counsel of Kansas Farm Bureau, and we have Stephen Dorf, apologize Stephen, <laughs> from Kansas Fiber Networks, and we have Mr. Don Landall, very famous, he's already, his name's already been brought up, the, the epitome of the rural entrepreneur here from Landall Corporation, founder and chairman, and we also have Jamie Meyer from the Landall Corporation as well. So with that, um, I'd like to actually first ask our audience just to get an idea of who's here, who do we have any farmers in the audience, just by a show of hands? Okay, we've got a few hands. How about anyone in the manufacturing, anyone in agriculture in general, any manufacturing technology? How about anyone in telecommunications, Broadband Networks? Excellent. Anyone in academia? I know we had a few, Kansas State, awesome. Great, just to get an idea of, of um, who's here. So with that, maybe we can start with Jamie, if you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself. Okay. Hi, uh, Jamie Meyer, and uh, I'm the sales manager for Landall Corporation. I've worked for Don for eight years. Um, I live over at Beloit and um, kind of head up that facility over there as, also, as, as well as our ag division. Um, started with Don eight years ago, and, and uh, you know, I think uh, with the communication, it's, it's really made it easy. Uh, it allowed me to continue to live in Beloit. I grew up there. Uh, I am rural. Uh, been there all my life. I have, you know, through my 22 years of, of being in the manufacturing business, I've been able to travel quite a bit. Uh, traveled territories in Indiana, down to Louisiana. And, and so I've had the opportunity to, to look around and, and, and see other places and cities and so forth. And, and I really want to be in, in Beloit, and, and I think that uh, people that grew up in rural communities want to come back. And I think one of the things that uh, we've got to do is, is get jobs and provide jobs. If they are there, they will come back. And I think uh, you folks and what you've done with communications has really helped that and improved that because now people can come back, have jobs in rural areas, and still uh, you know, do things worldwide. And, and I know there's a number of folks that have come back to our community and, and others as well. So uh, applaud what you've all done. Keep up the good work. Uh, keep getting those rates down and improving the, uh, uh, the bandwidth. So uh, happy to be here. Good morning. I'm Patty Clark. I serve as a state director for USDA Rural Development. And we do provide financing to many of our rural telecoms and rural cooperatives throughout the state of Kansas. 
Um, springing off of what has been said by the first panel, um, in my mind, broadband telecommunications, um, instant communications, uh, is, is the utility of the future. It's just exactly what electricity was 80 years ago. And not only our, our young generation is the next generation moving back, they, they want to move back, they are moving back to our rural communities. But they're not going to stay there unless we can provide high-speed internet. Um, this is an important decade for our rural communities in Kansas and across America in terms of the investment that we need to make, uh, removal of barriers in terms of communications, not only for production and agriculture, but for small business as well, for education, uh, for health care, for emergency services. I just had the opportunity the last two weeks to meet with um, a group of 21 to 39 year olds that are rural by choice. They're called the power ups. Um, incredible conversations in terms of what they're doing, where they have um, high speed internet service and, and repopulating rural communities. I also had a chance to sit in on a uh, broadband discussion at the Rural Opportunity Conference last week in Dodge City. Very eye opening. And then the third thing that I sat in on actually was a part of a panel, um, rural health care, with our uh, critical access hospitals a few weeks ago. Um, there's going to be some change in investment in our rural hospitals, moving not so much towards bricks and mortar as much as telecommunications infrastructure for telemedicine purposes. We're on the threshold of a lot of changes, um, but it's going to take a full force effort by everybody in this room and from all of our rural communities across the state to make it happen. Thank you. Jessica, thank you. Terry, Brian, appreciate the invite to come here today. Uh, my name's Steve Dorff. I'm with Kansas Fiber Network. Uh, I'm the other guy. I'm the guy that came from the city to rural America. Uh, a little bit different, took a little adjusting to. Uh, instead of driving seven hours in one day to visit my three offices in one city, Los Angeles, I could drive across the state now. <laughs> it's, it's very different. Uh, Kansas Fiber Network, uh, think of us as the new version of the interstate highway system or the uh, rural electrification of, of America. What we're doing is building those highways that connect companies like Blue Valley, Wilson, Golden Belt, Cunningham, Rainbow, Pioneer, and they're all represented in this room. They're building those local roads that reach out to the farms, to the homes, to the schools, libraries, hospitals, and we're connecting them via that interstate highway system, but the new system. It's all bits and bytes. It's light. And that's what we're building, and it's very exciting. You know, coming from the big city and coming out to, to Kansas, yeah, maybe a little bit of a chip on my shoulder. Uh, you know, they don't have the technology that we had in Los Angeles. No, they don't. They have better technology. And it's very exciting to see this happen and to, to know that I'm a part of something and, and a big change and helping people out in these rural communities get the connectivity that they need. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Don Landel, uh, president of Landel Corporation. Uh, obviously, uh, I've been in rural community here for, I uh, grew up about 20 miles to the west, but we uh, started out as a, grew up in a home where we didn't even have electricity So, so uh, until I was six years old. So as we, we talk about, you know, entrepreneurship a little bit, uh, at the uh, age of six, I got an erector set for my birthday, or for Christmas, excuse me, and uh, we, with an electric motor that we didn't have no place to plug it into. So, <laughs> so uh, you know, shortly that, thereafter, we did get electricity, but, you know, I'm, we're just talking about change here in, in economics. Uh, you know, but that's, that's where I got my start. Uh, I think uh, when my folks moved me from an, a Tinker Toys to an erector set at the... Uh, age of six, they seen my desire to uh, do things with my hands, and uh, so we did that. 
went on to uh, to vocational ag and, and then went went on and you know got my my first financial thing is started out with a Duroc hog with a gentleman earlier here so that was that was my first financial investment but uh, but then we went on and uh, got through high school I knew what I wanted to do I wanted to be an entrepreneur you know like to build things uh, ended up uh, buying a welding shop with a partner at the, at the age of 20 so uh, but with that uh, he didn't have that desire. He grew up in the 30s, and he wanted to get back to where he had a job where he knew that, he, you know, someone asked him once, and I think that's something that I, I preach to our employees and a lot of people. He said, uh, I was there with mom and dad when the sheriff took us off the farm in the dirty 30s when things, you know, tough times, knew what really tough times were. But, uh, but with my desire to lead on, uh, we've just uh, celebrated uh, 50 years last year of being in business. Uh, you know, we started. Uh, you know, with one em one employee, and, and now we employ uh, you know in excess of a thousand people. Uh, we hire people every day. I think uh, there were seven or eight there again this morning. Uh, uh, every Monday morning we hire. You know, because there there is a rollover of people in in rural America for many many reasons. It is not necessarily because they don't like rural America, but. But just to give you a little bit of idea, uh, you know, what, what broadband does for us, uh, currently within our system, we have uh, 270 telephones. Uh, so, and then we're all connected together with four digits, which we find very, very helpful. And when I say they're all hooked together, uh, we have Beloit, which is Jamie's area, uh, where he manages about 120 miles away. Uh, we have uh, another office in Brilliant, Wisconsin, a company we brought up there, brought the jobs back to, to rural Kansas. But uh, they have eight employees up there, but they're also on that four-digit number. So, you know, we can dial 562 and call Beloit or, or 700 miles away up to northern Wisconsin. So that works very good for us. Uh, we're hooked up to about 330 computers. Uh, computer terminals, and then we have another 120 terminals. So, so we, we've got about 450 terminals. So we, that, you know, our company is run with, with the broadband system. Uh, you know, they clock in, they job in and out, they, you know, inspection, uh, all our drawings, everything is transformed back and forth, back and forth. You know, when we, we got into all this, why we talk about uh, a paperless society and obviously uh, we get a long ways toward that paperless society but there, there is obviously still paper at the end of the tunnel but but the beautiful part uh, when they're building a part out in the shop they can take a drawing and blow it up or shrink it down I mean these are people that, that never got through high school I mean you know some do some don't but but the point I'm making here is uh, you know uh, all levels of education have, have learned how to use uh, the computer system uh, you know, we, uh, we have a, uh, a total of uh, roughly between 55 and 60 computer-operated machines uh, in seven locations. Them are all programmed out of one office. It's transformed over, over the broadband to those machines. You know, the uh, programming, that's all, uh, you know, their work orders come from that. Um, these machines are built all over the world. And being built all over the world, if, if uh, our people we, is all in-house, but uh, all the manuals there, you know, the foreign manuals, I can translate them to English manuals for them. But, but that's, uh, it's all done by Broadman. If there's a challenge that they can't handle on one of the lasers or something, they can plug that laser in and talk to our people over in Sweden or, uh, or Australia, or, uh, wherever, wherever the problem might be. So, so that's, it's very, very meaningful to us. Uh, so that just, just gives you some, I, I've got a whole list of things I could give, but uh, Obviously, day-to-day, uh, -day uh, that's what we run on, so thank you. Thanks, Don. Morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. Jessica, we wanted to give you the full Kansas experience, so if you're in the right places yesterday, you saw hail uh, following an 80 or 90 degree day on Saturday and brought the snow and Christmas time weather, according to the senator today. So I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, stick nice. around tomorrow. It'll be something else. <laughs> we may have covered all the options, but we'll think of something. Um, Thanks for the opportunity to be here. I'm Terry Holdren. I'm, the, as Jessica said, I'm the CEO and general counsel at Kansas Farm Bureau. KFB is the state's largest general farm organization. We have 40,000 
or so uh, member families who live on farms and ranches across Kansas and, and work every day to really to meet a goal that we have as an industry, which is to feed a growing and hungry world. Uh, we know that by 2050 or so, give or take a year, there'll be 10 billion people on the planet. Um, and at any given time, at least 1 billion of them are malnourished or starving. Um, and so our folks get up every day uh, and go to work to try to, to make that goal of feeding all of those mouths. Um, we know that the only way that we can do that is by advancing technologies, whether those are genetically modified crops or um, other ways that we produce more on less land with less inputs and less water than we did in the past. Um, we've got to use those technologies to meet that goal. And one of the pieces of that is the, the equipment technology that we have. Uh, precision agriculture is a, a way that we can meet that goal, do more with less, um, use less inputs, precisely apply pesticides and fertilizers, plant in straight rows, uh, which is a great thing if you're a farm kid like me who never could plant in a straight row. Um, that GPS technology is a wonderful invention. They don't let me on the tractor anymore because I don't know how to run it, but it's a great tool for our folks. Um, and it helps us to be more efficient with the resources that we're given. Um, our folks, it's important to note, are made up of families, uh, which means that the needs for technology don't just stop at the farm gate. Um, they extend to the rural community, and like folks have said all morning, um, include things like education and medicine and all of those community services that families benefit from um, when they interact with folks across the street or downtown or wherever it is. Uh, but inside the farm gate, we also have lots of needs and lots of ways to embrace and use the technologies that are out there. Um, it's not just a cell phone anymore, it's a tablet. It's a combine that talks to the tractor that tries to link up to the satellite and we quickly get past my technological expertise. Um, we're there already actually by just me saying that. Um, but how all those things work together and provide a picture of a farm and link that farm together in a way that lets everything work and function and we get the data in the right places at the right times is very important to our folks. Um, when I was talking to our national organization to try to get ready for this, they said make sure to remind them of a couple of things. One is that we as an organization are technology neutral. Um, I think what that means is that uh, we'll take an all of the above approach. We don't really care if it's cell service or fiber or broadband or whatever the technology might be. We need the application and need the service. We also need it to be reliable though and so we know that at the end of the day that fiber is probably the best way to make that happen but you've got to be able to get that to the right places. So that end of the line service for our folks who are very much rural by choice, um, and some of them very rural by choice, um, have challenges in getting access and getting that cable or that fiber to the end of the line, that last mile of service. Um, and we greatly appreciate and rely on you all here in the room who are our telecom folks as our partners in making that happen and, and getting that done. Um, and then the last thing is just simply, and I think it's been made clear today, don't forget agriculture as we move in this technology game. Um, we believe we have a critical role and need you all to help us as we move forward into the future uh, to meet the needs of a, a growing and hungry world. So thanks for the opportunity. Appreciate that conversation. Thank you. Thank you all so much. That was, that was fantastic. I hope, I hope my questions are still relevant now. <laughs> that was a very good overview. So kind of playing off of what has been said by, by all of you on some level, um, you know, this country has all levels of education, right? We want to make sure folks have a chance um, to to use their education or use their maybe their lack of education and still be able to have opportunities. Um, and a lot of those opportunities we want to be able to offer in rural communities. And broadband can be the solution to that. Um, and with that, um, entrepreneurship is part of the fabric of rural America. And Mr. Landall, you were described to me as the quintal, quintessential rural entrepreneur by other rural leaders. Um, you created a family business that was able to develop a transformative innovation. And so my question for you all to start off today is, um, how do we encourage innovation? How do we encourage leadership amongst rural youth? Um, is it through groups like FFA, 4-H, public-private partnerships? Um, is it through a USDA program, perhaps? Um, and do you have any examples or stories of that? A, a classic example, building off of the discussion this morning in terms of big data. Um, 
we have young entrepreneurs, that, that, that group of entrepreneurs that grew up with computers, with technology. You know, I look at my three-year-old granddaughter and she knows how to use the iPhone and the iPad and it just blows my mind. But that generation is gonna bring significant innovation to um, our rural communities, to our world. Um, but I'm meeting on Wednesday with a young man who's de developing software systems as well as hardware um, to be an alternative to that big data, to where farmers can capture their own data. Um, he'll, re he'll essentially become a, a repository for that data, determine the value of that data, and then be able to sell the data to the large companies. Um, that's innovation, that's creativity, that's entrepreneurship. He's gonna build an entire business around this. Um, and, and that's what I think we need to encourage through education, through interconnectivity, and through the technology that we're talking about today. Does anyone else wanna add on to that, Mr. Randall? Sure, why not? Uh, Bringing that technology out to rural areas, knowledge is power, right? And by having the broadband out, whether it's on a farm or a small town, uh, it, I'll, I'll give you an example. I have a 13-year-old kid, and like any dad, you know, I buy him the toys and things he wants. Now he wants computers, but about a year ago he wanted this Rubik's Cube, and so he's showing me how he can do it in three minutes. Like, wow, you know, show me how to do that. And he's trying to, you know, show me the algorithm to solve this thing. And finally, I just said, forget it. A week later, he comes back with a little robot that he built, which you put the cube in the robot, and it turns it and twists it. It has laser sensors, and it solves the cube for you. He said, here, Dad, now you can do it too. <laughs> I'm like, how'd you, where'd you find that? I found the software on the internet and I built the robot. So again, having that information highway into the home and putting it in the hands of our kids is what's going to drive that innovation in the future. Can I add on to it, either of you? Well, uh, my, my definition of entrepreneurship is, is one person's problem is another's opportunity. And uh, that's, that's where uh, we work on every day at our place. Uh, and those, those opportunities uh, have, have done wonders for us. Uh, but we, we look back, you know, I, I started out, you know, building farm equipment. Number one, just fabricating for, for other people. Then I got my own product line. You know, then, you know, as an entrepreneur, you know, how do you motivate that? How do you keep that moving? Well, then, you know, the product, of course, most any piece of farm equipment, maybe not livestock, but any other piece of farm equipment, it's always got seasons. So what do you do when it's not in season, the product that you're building, when people are not interested in it? So then, then you gotta diversify. So, so that's the word I, I'm very big on is diversification. And uh, I like to take that clear back. You know, my mother's still alive and, and owns a, still owns a uh, farmsteaded farm, but you know, the. Back in, when, in their day, as a child, you know, diversification on the farm was everything, you know, because we had our own chickens and eggs and, you know, milk and cream and made our own ice cream, all, all those things. But, but the point about that being, you know, that, that travels on through, through life. Uh, you, you've got to be able to fill in and, and diversify because we don't run down a smooth road, you know. We, we have the uh, ups and downs, the droughts, the economic times. So... Uh, so that's uh, diversification has been good to us. You know, we got in on the, uh, you know, so man, all of a sudden, uh, you know, what am I going to do? Tillage isn't selling year round. You know, bankers aren't very favorable when you're when you're young entrepreneurs. So then, you know, I say, hey, one person's problems another opportunity. It working for the uh, the local implement dealer. Why, uh, you know, we did some manufacturing. We were diversified. We did everything. Well, I was hauling farm equipment one morning, and and. Uh, I went out and picked up a tractor and man, you know, how dangerous that was because that was kind of the transition when they were still uh, 
two-wheel trailers behind pickup trucks are hauling the small farm equipment. Now we got 560s and 4020s, and man, I, I come very close to an accident one morning, and uh, and I couldn't make the hill, man, you know, loading that piece of equipment. So that's where I got the idea of building my first trailer. You know, a, you know, you got to make it easier to load this farm equipment to haul that for, for the it, for the dealership out to the farm because. Uh, you know that was all I all I knew about uh, that. Was well, then pretty soon we hit the early '80s in, on the trailer side, and man, you know business got tough in the farm equipment business. You know the implement dealers. You know obviously for everyone, a lot of farmers went broke in their early '80s. So uh, I started to look for other places to to sell that trailer. Well, you know things went on, and one of the first ones we got into was the uh, towing and recovery. You know, these are the people that, you know, and that was actually brought to me from a, from a customer again. He said, hey, we got a real problem out here hauling buses and, and uh, major e uh, equipment failures, you know, wrecks on the highways. Uh, you know, uh, I'm willing to come out from, from Massachusetts and show you what you can do to take the, your trailer and make it suitable for the towing and recovery industry. Well, that, that has taken us a long, long ways, and, and uh, I just got to pictures this morning, but you know, we all know, or most of us heard of the bad wreck up in Washington where the, where the bus and the FedEx truck run into each other. Well, I've got a picture where, you know, they're hauling that bus off the accident site with our trailer, which we do very well in that business. But, but just talk about diversification, you know, we, our trailer industry alone belongs to nine different associations because we're, you know, that many people specialize and, you know, they keep coming. You know, the most recent one is, is the railroads. The railroads are no longer taking care of, of you know, Union Pacific, and they'll, they don't no longer want that small, uh, the uh, what we would call as older people call section gang work. So, so now they've got their association. You know, we're hauling their equipment with our trailers. So they're just unbelievable opportunities out there. You know, their problem is moving rail equipment from the UP to the Santa Fe or to whoever. So we're we're doing that for them. Uh, most all of you got uh, UPS. Uh, you know, everybody's got uh, satellites. Every uh, G GPS satellite, <clears throat> we're told that is uh, is hauled on a on a Lando trailer. You know, we uh, we got started at Cape Canaveral. We have 13 trailers hauling satellites and other equipment around Cape Canaveral. So, so the point I'm trying to lead to here, you never know where it's going to take you. You just got to go. You know, we were brought the opportunity for forklifts from England. Here's a person with entrepreneur had a product that would sell in America, you know, but he didn't know how to how to you know had no means of producing it in America. So so we got into into that business, you know. So uh, and then the government business, uh, you know, like Pat Roberts said, we've been working together since uh, uh, big time since uh, 1986 or 85 actually. Uh, but that's when we got our first big government contract. And, and the, the Pat Roberts, the representative there, those days he would go to the, even go to the fridge and get your pop. You know, I mean, he, them were the good, when he was still getting started in Washington. But but the point being, those people can't get you government contracts, but they can keep the road level for for all Americans. So uh, so that that's a big part. But you know, we're proud to say that we've never been without a government contract contract since uh, 1984. So so those kind of things. Uh, it have been very good, for, but I'm trying to, that's kind of generalized, but the point I'm making is the entrepreneurship, you know, you know, you never know where it's going to come from. You know, our, our veterinary friends across the hi highway here, the catty corner down the road here, you know, two veterinaries started a mail order business. Now they got a, 120 people shipping products, you know, across America in, in, into Canada. Uh, we ourselves uh, last year did business in 39 countries. So, so, you know, there's a lot of opportunities, which we're getting back to uh, with the internet, uh, you know, online ordering, you know, the implement dealers, uh, we've got Brandon here, you know, people are, are real, very busy, but we can order, uh, they can order parts 24 hours a day, seven days a week from us. So that works out very well. Uh, so they can go out on evening or Saturday or Sunday and put in parts orders and then our people come to work at uh, six o'clock in the morning, and you know they got orders to fill. So there's just so many advantages uh, that uh, problems, uh, warranty. Uh, you know, you know we're no different than anybody else. We either have problems or you know challenges out in the field. 
they take their, their cell phone, take a picture, wire that in. Jamie gets it. He can relay it to me within, within 20, 10, 15 minutes. We got, you know, people in South Dakota or South, you know, wherever. Uh, there are pictures here where we can analyze them, you know, and help them out. So there, there's a lot of different directions uh, entrepreneurs can come from. Thank you all so much. And I think that's, that's a huge part of is recognizing challenges as opportunities. And I think that's, that's kind of, again, the fabric of rural America. We face a lot of challenges. Um, so with that being said, we've talked a lot about technology and technology and agriculture and that, again, being ch a change. We've had a lot of changes happen, even in the last 10 years. So a lot of folks don't recognize that agriculture is so tech heavy. Um, so my question for you next is, can you um, talk a little bit about what the most surprising technological advancement has been in the world of agriculture. And Terry, I know you mentioned precision ag, and that's huge, obviously, when, when you think of broadband and technology and agriculture, precision ag. If you want to describe a little bit more about what precision ag has done and if there's any, anything more surprising to you um, in the role or, of, of technology in agriculture. I'm the wrong person to ask that question to. We should ask Sharon or Leo or any of the producers in the room uh, who actually get their hands on that stuff every day. Um, you know, the, the most surprising opportunity in, in Precision Ag, I think, is just the opportunity to link all of those services together and to run them from a tablet. You know, that's the, the, the young, well, they're not all young, some older too, producers that I talk to on a regular basis about what they're doing on their operations. That You know, recently we had a, Deal. I was talking to somebody about, you know, they were trying to figure out which tablet to buy because that tablet was going to be the collection point for the yield monitor data from the combine and something from the grain cart. This is where I don't really know what I'm talking about anymore. Uh, you know, and, and the stuff from the GPS data mapping system in their field, which tra tracks their um, soil quality and what water got put where, and so that at the end of the day, what they would be able to do is tell you exactly in a sort of per square foot basis on that particular field, what the yield was, what inputs were there, um, what they might change to improve the next cycle or the next season for them. Um, those kinds of advances have been very helpful to our folks and the ability to pull all that data together. I think we have a way to go to solve the big data challenge, but a long way actually. <laughs> But the ability to do that on a farm is, is very impressive. Um, you know, the advent of, of um, moisture sensors that you can put throughout a field that can tell you to shut down part of the sprinkler in this part or to apply, you know, more water in another part. Um, huge advances. So there's lots of opportunity. Um, but yeah, we still tr struggle at times. Um, I have a f friend who's a certified Angus purebred breeder uh, down in the south central part of the state and they're data connection is a service called dial-up. Um, some of you may be familiar with that, 20, 25 years ago kind of a thing. Um, they sell purebred Angus bulls internationally, and they update their website by pressing go at 9 o'clock at night and hoping it's done by the next morning. Um, so the challenge, I mean, the opportunity is great, and we see it all over the place where folks are using what's out there. Uh, the challenge is still great because those limitations are significant on folks and their ability to do what they need to do. So, Jamie, do you want to add to that at all? Uh, yeah. You know, <clears throat> I think it's going to be truly amazing. You, know, you, you mentioned the young kids and their abilities on the on the devices and how far advanced they are from us. I mean, when I was in college, it, you know, the internet just started to pop up on the on the scene. And so my kids are way past me already, you know, as far as their uh, technology skills. Uh, but I think, you know, as we see that uh, uh, coming together, um, you know, and we're going to have some amazing things and some amazing, you know, there's problems out there we don't even know yet that, that these kids are going to be able to solve and, and move forward and, and take care of agriculture. Um, you know, so, and then getting into the livestock, you know, that's a whole other uh, piece of the pie that's way beyond my scope uh, but you know I think there's going to be some pretty good tracking and and as far as tracking the animals and so forth moving forward and and so I'm sure that uh, technology and broadband is going to have a pretty big impact and all that so you know it's going to be interesting to see what the kids come up with just one quick thought 
um, Friday, I think it was, the governor's group that's addressing water, uh, not for the first time after receiving input from, I don't remember how many thousands of uh, folks uh, in not only rural areas, but urban areas as well. And I think Terry touched on briefly the nexus between energy and water use and what's coming for Kansas in the future and how technology can help in that regard. And I think about our farmers and ranchers that are monitoring their uh, irrigation systems from an iPhone, from their computer, to do that precision watering that Terry mentioned. I think we're going to have to do more than that. And that's going to require a technology investment um, that we have yet to make statewide, but I think it's coming. Um, that's, you know, you're going to save energy, you're going to save water, and I think both of those are very, very, very important, both to livestock producers and to farmers across the state. So, um, we, we talked a little bit about it, I know Terry mentioned this, kind of stepping out of the farm gate for a moment and kind of taking a look at the entirety of the, of the rural community and looking at the farm family. So a question for all of you, um, what role do you see and have you seen broadband enabled technologies playing in healthcare, education, public safety, small business, and what really is driving the bandwidth usage in rural communities if you have any examples of that? Let's talk about some pragmatic, very real life um, examples. And I'm going to go back to um, the, the critical access hospitals and um, stroke victims. Um, if you can get a quick treatment to a stroke victim within the first seven to ten minutes um, through your emergency care uh, services, that can mean all the difference in the world, not only between living and dying, but the quality of life of that victim. That's going to take telecommunications. I look at the young lady who's pregnant in the audience. Um, you know, one of the things that I heard from our, our critical access hospitals on the panel that I uh, participated in was the um, uh, OBGYN services. And, and our hospitals, all hospitals, going to be able to provide that? Maybe not. Maybe not the prenatal services that some uh, babies are going to need. Um, that's going to require telecommunication services. Education, you know, classic example. When my sons went to school, um, which was several years ago, <laughs> they, were on the, they were on the bus for, for 55 minutes going and 55 minutes coming back. Um, and, and from what I'm hearing from our rural superintendents, that length of time on the bus may become longer because of cuts to transportation funding. And what can they do on that bus ride? Um, that they maybe connect at school, download, and, and use that time um, going to school, coming to school. Those are all very pragmatic, practical applications of technology that we're going to have to rely upon if we choose to live in rural America. I agree, Patty. There, there's a lot on the healthcare front. Uh, we're seeing advances in telemedicine. Uh, it's difficult sometimes to get medical providers to move out to some of these smaller towns and rural areas. Uh, but it doesn't mean you can't get that same level of care now via the network. So you can have a health care provider uh, based in, say, Wichita or Kansas City and reading films, reading radiology reports from somebody that's hundreds of miles away and bridging that gap. Uh, you know, using fiber, using the network to do that, it's pretty important. That helps to, to reassure people who are thinking of living in that rural area, but may be hesitant because the services they want or need may not be available, that yes, they are. And we're using technology to do that. Uh, so remote radiology, imaging, education. Uh, one of my children, I have three teenagers, uh, takes some remote classes uh, from a provider, uh, E-Academy, out of Elkhart, Kansas, way in the southwest corner of the state. And we live outside of Wichita. Uh, ten years ago, people would have laughed. 
if you had said, you know, my kid's taking an E class, you know, from another part of the state, but now it's pretty commonplace. Um, even in our homeschool in Andover, they have an E academy. So if you don't want to send your kids for whatever reason to the to the traditional brick and mortar school, just as you know, schools are changing, just as uh, e-commerce has. Right, brick and mortar stores are on the wane, but you're seeing more and more web-based, and so we're seeing that happening out uh, in the rural areas. Uh, in public safety, you know, there's enhanced or e911 systems in Kansas. Uh, we're involved with that, as are many of the independent telcos, to bring a very higher, high level of service out to these rural areas. Uh, even at the federal level with FirstNet, uh, we learned our lesson after 9-11, that the airwaves become crowded, uh, and that we need specific bandwidth set aside, frequencies set aside for our first responders. And these are all, all this is going to cover the not only urban but rural areas of the state. Uh, E-commerce, web design, cloud computing, all that can be done now from the farm and connected to the big data centers or big data cloud, uh, no matter where that is, not just in Kansas but anywhere in the country or the world for that matter. So. A lot going on here. Uh, we look at ourselves as building these new highways to bridge the rural-urban gap. And uh, we've only seen just the beginning. You know, people are looking at uh, what's going on in Kansas City with Google Fiber. Who hasn't heard of that? Gigabit Fiber. Sounds pretty impressive. In rural Kansas, we now have the ability to do 100 gigabit per second service. 100 times faster than Google Fiber. That's what we're doing here in the state. That's what we can bring to the rural areas of Kansas, and we're pretty excited about it. Excellent. It is very exciting, and I think, obviously, again, broadband plays a role in so many different industries that affect rural communities. Um, NTCA has a foundation called the Foundation for Rural Service and FRS, and they re released certain white papers, uh, educational white papers. There's one that's been called Aging in Place, um, and the idea that you can stay in your home and not have to be forced out into um, maybe a retired healthcare community, um, and you can be monitored, and you can have, you, know, you can send your, your, your blood samples to your doctor who may be four hours away. Because so I think the idea that Patty, the, the concept Patty mentioned about stroke victims, I mean the idea that you could send your information to maybe a local clinic as opposed to having to drive to a hospital that may be four or five hours away for a lot of communities is the difference between life or death and it's a quality of life issue. Um, Distance education opportunities are huge. I mean, the idea that, you know, I've talked to some folks who live in North Dakota, and um, one of our members was telling me, you know, her son can take Spanish now. And that was never even an opportunity or an option for him before, to take a foreign language. Um, one of our members in South Dakota actually, as a small business opportunity, took advantage of teaching kids in South Korea English. So they've now employed hundreds of people in South Dakota which is a huge number for a small community in teaching English to people in South Korea. So the idea that broadband has opened up this opportunity. So I know Farm Bureau does a lot with education opportunities on a national level in, in rural communities and education, healthcare is huge and rural economic development. I don't know, Terry, if there's anything you wanna add just to talk about the programs. Yeah, very quickly, I think, you know, these opportunities that broadband can bring to a rural community, quite frankly, are the, the thing that can keep a community from becoming a growing community to a, or a dying community. It's, it's that critical and that important of a challenge today. Um, it's the thing that can bring young entrepreneurs back who maybe one of them is running the family farm, but the spouse is doing something else that's, you know, distance connected or telecommuting or whatever the right term for that is. It's, it's guys like Don who, you know, I don't think much happens at Landall Corp that doesn't involve data of some kind and certainly you don't sell product all over the world without data connections happening. Those things drive rural economies. Those things make us the, the opportunity zone of, of the future. So there's lots of things um, that can happen 
today that couldn't have happened before. I, I'm not that old, but I took Spanish classes at Syracuse High School in far southwest Kansas in the late 1980s. Um, distance learning, huge satellite dish is what brought that teacher to us. I think somebody's using that as a flower bed in their yard now because um, it's a fiber connection that actually makes that happen today. So all those opportunities are, are huge in rural communities. Um, and it's, it's one of the things that we've got to focus on if we want to attract those young people back. Because they won't come back from the cities unless those opportunities to have adequate health care, um, you know, educational opportunities, social interaction opportunities are, are there and are able to fulfill that need. Well, I think this discussion's been very, very helpful today um, because obviously the idea of a community is, is not just the fiber network, it's the folks taking advantage of the fiber network and using it in every way possible. And again, what Terry just said about kids recognizing they can move back into their communities, and I think we're seeing an increasing trend of kids that have gone away for college and they've maybe stayed away for a few years in the city because you know maybe there are more things to do maybe they think I have this broadband connection I can't I need to check my Facebook every two minutes obviously but now the idea that we can create communities that offer all of these opportunities is huge because then it's increasing the the idea that there could be more entrepreneurs like Don. We could have them next Don or Mark Zuckerberg in a rural community but we may not have any idea they exist because they might not have that broadband connection to allow these educational opportunities or allow them to be innovative. So I think I think what Stephen said about having that broadband connectivity and the, the, the power that fiber bandwidth can provide is huge. Um, and we, some of us might be tech, you know, tech neutral, I, I think we all recognize the opportunities that just being open to the conversation of developing our technologies is huge. Um, so just briefly, I'm speaking from two microphones now, so I'll step back. Um, we're kind of nearing our end of time here. So I wanted to ask each of you if you could say something to a policymaker in Washington or to uh, a young rural kid who's maybe moved away and doesn't really see any opportunities for moving back, what would be your message to that policymaker or that kid to say that rural is relevant, that you have opportunities? What would be your message um, if you had an opportunity to do so. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> to the policymakers, um, and and it's, this is an acknowledgement of our rural telecoms of the Kansas fiber network. Um, the investment that these companies, these entities, have made in rural America is enormous. Um, and they have done so with care for their community. And community not just where their headquarters are, but the citizens that they serve. And that's a different motivator than just profit. Um, and so that has to be considered, that has to be a part of the policy equation in DC, in Topeka. Um, that these companies, um, these entities, are providing not only a business service, but they're also providing care for community. And I think that's really important in rural America right now. So if it, if it makes it easier, it makes it easier just to, to reflect. Um, it, it's, it's, I'm asking each of you from your each individual perspectives. You know, you each represent some incredible interests here at the table. Um, and I think that if you were to talk, have Senator Roberts in front of you right now, and he were to vote on a bill that could determine the future of rural America, what would you say to him before he made that decision? I mean, would, would you reflect upon the, the importance of rural youth? What would it be? Because, again, we are, at a, we are at a low, a historic low of members of Congress from rural America. So those, those opportunities we have to talk to our policymakers, and I encourage all of you to speak to them. I know Terry's big at getting out up to the hill and Sally as well and talking to our policymakers. Um, I, th I think we all need to work on our message. I know I do um, to our policymakers because they need to know how important rural America is. So with that, I'm sorry, I'll pass the floor. Yep, okay. Um, I guess one of the things that's, that's pretty important to, to, to me and, and Landall Corporation and, and anybody in agriculture is, you know, uh, the farm bill that they've recently passed, um, you know, was uh, taken a lot out of the direct payments to farmers. And I know 
you know, we've really come through. We've had excellent times here in the last three or four years, um, and, our, and our producers have made money, and it hasn't historically always been there. Uh, right now where the grain prices are at, it could be better. Uh, I, I listened to a gentleman last week uh, from Iowa, and he was very concerned, uh, and uh, he, he, he quoted uh, four and a quarter um, corn, the price of corn. He said that's, that doesn't take, uh, that's our break-even point right now, but that doesn't include labor, and that doesn't include uh, uh, land rent or land, uh, land value. And so uh, he says that, you know, it's going to be very difficult for him uh, in this upcoming year to be very profitable. And so, you know, as we look at government programs, you know, uh, we got to keep uh, the, the, the farmers strong and make sure that they're able to be profitable. Uh, they are survivors and uh, uh, they're very innovative, but uh, we need to, to keep those folks in mind. And, and, uh, um, and then also, uh, the Section 179 is going to be pretty important to us as we move forward and, and the accelerated depreciation or the bonus uh, depreciation. Uh, for, for our producers, and, and not only the producers, but us as manufacturers as well. So anybody that's in business, uh, we need that uh, Section 179. So I guess those are the two areas that uh, I think will, will help uh, the overall economy, not only rural, but it'll help uh, the American people keep, keep moving forward. Well, if I have the opportunity to, to speak with uh, the FCC and Chairman Wheeler, I'd say keep competition alive. Since divestiture in 1984, we've seen all kinds of new innovations in telecommunications. Uh, we're all of us in this room uh, benefiting from those innovations, uh, whether you're small independent telco or a large telco. It's been driven by competition, the ability to compete. And what's happening now, it almost seems like there's a war on the independent telcos and the small telcos. You heard QRA mentioned earlier. It has to go. Uh, let everybody play on a level playing field. I'm not saying we should favor one over the other, but don't disadvantage the independent telcos because they've led to a lot of the innovation that's out there now. So that would be my message. Thanks. I was waiting on you. <laughs> well, I, you know, I think the rest of the panel has covered it very well in terms of the message to, to Congress or the message to policymakers. Um, the thing that I would add, I think, is that government can, for once, lead that opportunity. Um, rural communities are ready to embrace um, some of those changes. Our folks, our producers, the guys running around with the tablets, they got all their data on them. When they go to the FSA office to sign up for programs, they get the big chief tablet approach, which comes with a box of crayons. Um, we've got a far ways to go before we can link those systems together. Um, so that's point number one. Um, to, the, to the young folks who are out there who are thinking about what to do and where to do it, um, they should know that there are vibrant, progressive communities across America and across Kansas um, where they can have successful futures, um, raise families that are based on values and have high quality of life um, with less stress and all of the things that, that we all who live in larger communities look for and work for. So that chance is out there and they should embrace it and come home to a rural community. I guess, uh, you know, what would I, you know, talk to politicians about and one of the the biggest uh, political position I ever got into was uh, I was uh, put on the uh, Transportation 2000 board for the state of Kansas in, uh, in obviously 2000. And, uh, you know, we visited 14 communities across the state of Kansas groups, much like we have here today. They got, brought their thoughts and ideas what they wanted for their communities. And uh, one, of the, one of the things that uh, I'm a big believer in is, is live and let live. You know, we got to understand each other. But in that transportation thing, uh, one thing helped me a lot in the rural areas as well as, you know, busy areas is they give us a map of the state of Kansas with all the major highways on it and then showed traffic count per, li per lane mile. 
and by showing traffic count per lane mile, why, you know, obviously, uh, where's all the traffic at? You know, it's in the cities. But then you turn that around, and we had our charts that uh, the state did a very good job of providing us. And, you know, the lane miles in, in rural America were much more expensive than the lane miles were in, in the city areas. You know, the state of Kansas, and Sharon can tell me better, but I, I think we're between six and seven counties now have the controlling vote. You know, you know if you, if you want to go just by popular vote, well, if we went by popular vote, we would get nothing in rural Kansas. So I think people like Sharon, uh, you know, they got to do a good job of, you know, all our politicians of, of uh, listening and, and live and let live, understand, you know, that, hey, they do have, in, in the case of the transportation, they do have lots of cars there. We got to provide them some roadways because we're going to go there and use the roadways, but yet uh, let them know that rural America, they're going to come out here and use those roads. Uh, part of that uh, transportation 2000 was the aircraft side. Well, we went to the cities, you know, they have plenty of money, uh, you know, get the federal monies pretty easily for their airports, but rather than be against us, they was for rural America to say, hey, that's, that's where our people are coming from, rural America. We need rural, uh, rural Kansas airports, you know. So, so it's that live and let live, and, and, you know, we seem to have a thing in Washington right now, everybody wants all or nothing, and when you want all or nothing, not much gets done. Well, thank you all so much. I think your comments were fantastic. Um, I think we're up, our time is up, but is there anything anyone else wants to add before we finish? No? Well, thank you all for listening. I think we're going to move into our lunch hour now. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yes, those were good comments. We really appreciate it. And uh, before we break for lunch here, uh, we'd like to thank Landall Corporation for sponsoring lunch today. I guess you got up and fixed this this morning for us, Don. Did you do that? But before we take a quick break here, I'd like to have uh, uh, Donna come up here and visit, and she's going to kind of go through the procedure for, for what we're going to be talking about during lunch here. So, Donna. Thank you so much. I'm with the Institute for Civic Discourse and Democracy at Kansas State University, and we're all about harvesting ideas from dialogue. So this is going to be a working tabletop lunch conversation. One person at each desk, desk, see I'm from the university, I'm always at my desk. Uh, one person at each table has a sheet like this. They're not exactly your moderator, but they are going to be paying really close attention to what happens. Because here's what we want to happen. While you're talking, we want you to use the blue sheet of card that's in front of you to write down any questions. They may not all be answered today, but they're going to be captured. This conversation is designed to capture your ideas and your contributions so that they can be passed on to the National Telecommunication, <laughs> National NCTCA. Now, here's what we want to happen, though. Towards the end of the conversations, as you've noted down your questions on the blue card, the yellow card is for your ideas that you want to explore. And here's where we'd like you to all come together. 15 minutes before the end of the lunch conversation, we'd like you as a group at your table to see if you can agree on priorities, two of them. And on the white sheet, it says that the priority could be phrased as an issue, you know how we say she's got issues? An issue is a problem that needs investigating. An opportunity, which would be an idea for collaboration or interaction, or an action, a real proposal that's ready to be implemented. So issues, opportunities, or actions, that's the way we're framing these priorities. If your table, after a lot of healthy, cross-disciplinary, cross-sector conversation can come up and donate to your moderator two priorities that can be framed as one of those three things. We'll gather all that together, and then we're going to be doing some harvesting of what we're hearing you saying, the questions you're being asked after lunch. Does that make sense to anybody, to everybody? We've, we've captured some themes here that I want to put out we know that the conversation is going to range real wide, but we think it might be helpful just to remind you of some of the themes that have been raised here. And so I'm going to have people hold up these cards. And if a table has hands saying, yeah, I really want to talk about that theme, we're going to put it at that table. If you start and then disperse to other themes, that's fine. But uh, 
hold up that one, data management. We've heard people talking about the problem of who owns data, how is it managed. If you want to talk about data management, hold up your theme. We're actually going to encourage you to stay at the same tables you're at. Here's some other themes that we've been hearing about. Network build out. We've got an expert here in network build out. If that's something you want to be talking about, think about that theme. We've heard about applications in telemedicine. Does anybody want to talk, start a conversation on telemedicine in particular? If not, I'm dropping it. Telemedicine? Great. Now the holder of that card doesn't have to report out, but, okay. Universal service funds, what's changing in Washington in Topeka for that? Anybody want to start a conversation on universal service funds? There you go. As I say, it's just a conversation starter. Broadband adoption and utilization. Probably half this place could talk about adoption and utilization. Any hands for this? Great. Education, higher education, training, K-12. Anybody want to start a conversation on education? No hands? It goes down. Oh, whoop. Education. Okay. Business development, entrepreneurship, business development. Our model here. <laughs> God with me. Innovations themselves, new great innovations that are happening. Who would like to start that conversation? There we go. Thank you, sir. And what did we leave out? Want anybody want to shout out an idea that's been totally neglected that they heard talked about, they want to start their conversation on? If not, I trust you're all ca plenty capable of starting a conversation on one of the many of the topics. And again, as I say, I'm going to be going around clarifying any questions about how we're going to harvest all your ideas, but it's going to be the job of the moderator to capture what you decide in the last 15 minutes are two priorities for NTCA to hear about. So have fun. And we'll get back with you and be, begin summarizing what you've said at the end of lunch. And what we've decided to do, because this is so rich and we've got such a diverse group of people here, is to do a round robin and I'm going to read all of your two priorities. I'm not going to try to pre-filter them or cluster them because they're all unique. After that, what I would like to do as I read them is ask few key questions and I'm going to get help passing the mic to those people who want to answer them about what's the status, the situation, and outlook for these priorities and what needs to be done. Okay? Was it helpful to think about things in terms of whether it was an issue, an opportunity, or an action, or was that just jargon? Did that help you organize your thoughts at all? Because all three are really important. Okay, table number one. Table number one said that a key priority is uniformity in the systems that are used. Standardization, interoperability in the systems themselves of broadband. And number two was how to bring training, broadband training, to all users addressing issues of standards, and availability in broadband education itself. Did I correctly get that? Okay. Table number two, priority number one was collaboration between local schools and universities to provide, to provide AP classes via broadband. So this is addressing a particular K-12 education, advanced placement, using broadband. And second, closely related to that was an opportunity, public-private partnerships, 
public libraries could serve as locations for discussions to take place. So the opportunity for collaboration is across public libraries and public schools and public-private partnerships. So we're thinking opportunities there. Table three, first priority was infrastructure cost and sustainability. That's an issue. And the second was an opportunity. PR campaign is needed toward consumers, which will basically impact the legislators. Table number four is in the shelf here. You like the table number four? You want to bring it up? This was a lively table. It took them a long time to finally narrow it down, but their first priority, again, the theme of education. We don't know what we don't know. And I believe that referred to education in broadband literacies, digital literacies. Did I get that right? The second was adoption, broadband adoption by the public, pursuing that. Table number five, priority number one was an issue, and that is one we've heard about earlier, data ownership. And their second priority was education of the public using the common vernacular. So if you're going to educate people about their ownership rights, don't mystify them, am I correct? Use language that the public can understand. And some really good examples were given. Table six, sharing and security implementation. Did I get that correct? Oh, that's right. You put it on a blue card. Here we go. Everybody has it. There we go. The ideas, and all of this was focused on telehealth over here on table six. Continued collaboration between NTCA and its member companies for, with healthcare insurance companies and regulators to incentivize and affect change. That's an opportunity. Another opportunity recommended with regard to telehealth is continued sharing of ideas among NTCA members and healthcare providers to create models of economically feasible adoption. Table seven. Priority one is sustaining public funding to support sustainable and predictable access. Public funding is the focus for table seven. And second, again, the word education, education slash training opportunities to get qualified quality employees or provide workforce training in the broadband sector, correct? Table eight. Please do. I was gonna ask for some clarifying questions, but I like spontaneity, especially if you can clarify. Still don't know. Yeah, no, there he is. Okay. So one of the additional kind of uh, components or aspects of that is that we we re recognize that that just competition uh, wasn't didn't um, necessarily address quality, and so just having access of a couple of different providers didn't necessarily mean that in these rural communities um, that you'd get high quality uh, broadband access, and that was important to add. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, no. well, what, we were trying to, what we were trying to do was stress that we keep hearing across from the politicians, and we we're talking about very few of them now are the minority are from rural America, is we keep hearing, well, AT&T and Verizon and everybody there, well, competition is competition. Well, what we're looking at here in this setting, that's not so, in the sense that the RLX are have made a major investment pursuant to the 96 Act and that a lot of their action isn't pure profit like Verizon, AT&T, it's the community and the, and, the, and the things that go along with that. And so when you keep hearing it, well, you're competing, 
yes, in a certain deal with AT&T, AT&T and Verizon's never going to put fiber out in the rural area. They're not going to do the same thing. So just because they have wireless out there, we need to educate the politicians that there's a difference between that, the competitors. I just heard an action proposal there. Good. Uh, table eight, broadband awareness. Education on broadband issues, concerns, availability, and community resources and assets. Again, a focus on education. Two, future network planning. Sounds like we could flesh that out. That's an opportunity, as well as an action item. Future network planning, continuing to grow the network. Excellent. And table nine. Number one issue was inequality. Not all towns are equal. One town has great broadband services. The next town still has dial-up. It's hard for a company that has an office in each town. How to make them equal? And that was such an important issue that that was it. That's priority for table number nine. And table 10 had number one, collaboration. This is an opportunity between academic institutions, federal agencies, telcos, private companies. Number two, <laughs> broadband, applications, safe development, and adoption. They added number three. There's always somebody that won't quit with two. No one size fits all answer. Every community is different, and we just heard that before as well. Now what I'd like to do is, I'm gonna randomly select a couple of these and ask you to probe a little bit deeper. Let's just take the data ownership people. Uh, I wanna ask what achievements or actions underway exist that could address public education on data ownership? What actions are underway that we could build on? I'm oh, sorry, table number nine. <laughs> I'm gonna get help you. Number five? Do we have any actions? Okay, hey, Jeremy's Achievements we can build on or actions underway. Uh, good day, my name is Jeremy. I'm from Highland Community College. Um, basically, we've uh, discussed data ownership over here at this table, and we've come that uh, pretty much figured out that we're for it, <laughs> except for the parts that we're against. So, um, what actions can we take? Well, one of the things we came up with is just um, putting data ship ownership in your hand, putting data ownership in your hands. Um, how many of you have gone through and clicked I agree, I agree, I agree to anything you're creating, a Google account, a Yahoo account, anything like that? You've probably given your firstborn away and not realized that, and pretty soon they'll come to collect. Well, we don't understand that because we, we read what's called a EULA, End User License Agreement, that's 93 pages long, and I don't have the time to read that. I don't have time to make microwave pizza. So I'm not looking at 93 pages to figure out what I'm giving away. Making those um, EULAs easier, and in the common vernacular, instead of legalese, pardon me, um, would be much uh, greatly uh, benefit the end user to where it's, down to three bullet points or four bullet points. Hey, Google owns your data, that we can do whatever we want with it. Sucks to be you. And um, if, I, if I like that, I could click agree and be done. If I don't, I don't click agree and I move on. <laughs> Great. We have a response. I'm new to RUS, and my previous life uh, was with the Department of uh, Army, Army Corps of Engineers. Um, and one of the things that they're working on in Pittsburgh is actually this very equation with water tables and water banks. Um, there's a current study going on between West Virginia University, Carnegie Mellon, um, the Port of Pittsburgh, the Army Corps of Engineers, and a lot of the federal agencies in that region that what they're doing is they're building a GIS system that takes all of the data points that all of these different groups are getting from Coast Guard to 
geological surveys to everything else like that, and they're trying to put it in the supercomputers through Carnegie Mellon to build a, a data source. So there are examples of groups out there that are working with GIS data, databases and building systems that you could copy off of and work. Now, the, the test bed is in Pittsburgh, but the whole purpose of this, this system was to go nationwide with a GIS test bed. And so there are groups that are working from an academic and social aspect to build GIS databases. And it's something that, you know, from the IT system that would fit right in with what they're doing, especially when you're talking about farming, water tables, those kind of things, that there are groups out there that are building these kind of systems that might be worth looking into. So a model. And I'm assuming that in the description of the data, ownership is and origin is also part of it? And, and, it, and a lot of it is, is common sharing. I'll know all the federal agencies in that area, all the federal agencies in that area of Pittsburgh have signed on and agreed, well, except for the IRS, have agreed to provide all of their data um, to this system. And then the ownership stays with whoever has it. This is just an input method that everybody can plug into, and it brings all of the data together for searchable, usable resources. Brilliant. I'd like to hear a model. Another response? I think along with that is helping producers understand that right now the way the landscape is with the data input, data collection, they're really serving as an experiment field, much like what land-grant universities have served for decades um, for the large companies, for DuPont, for Pioneer, for Monsanto. That data is coming in field by field, and, and, and they become an experiment field, field by field, for those companies, and, and re receive absolutely no value back for supplying that data. I think that's number one. I think they've got to understand that, that, you know, that data is important for a lot of reasons, and it's their data, and they need to derive some value when they, rather than give it away and then pay the tech fee on top of the per bags, you know, seed tech fee. They've got to understand the value of the data. Okay, I'm going to pull from table one. Pro yes. Another response. Good. Good. Uh, Jada and I are working with NREDA. NREDA is working with a Kansas company that does data collection for basically the uh, electrics and telephone cooperatives. And the database is community assets. Okay, it's your, your network alignment, how much network, how much broadband you're providing, uh, the type of education of your, your community, what's available, uh, railroads, highways, you name it, buildings that are available. So when a business is looking for a specific thing, specific data points, they go to this database, pull it up, and then it spits out, well, you got 15 communities in Kansas that meet this criteria. Then that 15 communities kind of bid on it. But we're looking at a database that will improve the broadband initiatives in a rural environment through a database collection. And so from that perspective, I think Kansas is going to be starting to take a lead on this as well. So. One other thing that we also have to think about is, is, is liability as well for the farmer. Because if all this data is being collected, um, one of the examples I'll use is, is food safety with beef cattle. We now test hundreds of thousands of lots of cattle at packing plants for E. coli 0157H7, and we know where the cattle that were positive originated from. But to protect the farmers and ranchers from this, these data are delivered to a third party group in Washington, D.C., where the anonymity of farms and ranches are maintained so that it is not brought back on the farmers and, and ranchers. And so not only is there the opportunity of loss of uh, or giving information that will be used against yourself uh, in advertisement, but there's also the potential of if there are environmental, sustainable, agricultural issues that might pop up in the future and other companies have information about your farm or ranch that could be used against you. The last response here for you. Behind you. Oh, sorry. Um, I unfortunately don't know very much about ag business, but 
when they were speaking about uh, Gmail and Hotmail, <clears throat> even though they are on the surface free email services, nothing's free. They, they actually get their valuable information. They're talking about using your email to data mine and use that metadata. So if you think of, if you are, have a farm and you have an agribusiness, you do not want free email. <laughs> uh, it's, it's like um, owning a corporation and not using an enterprise server. It's basically opening it for anyone to use. If you own an ag business and you don't want your data mined, pay for your email. Okay, I'm gonna take another one. Uniformity in systems used, interoperability. What I wanna ask is, and this came from table one, uh, what constraints or hindrances exist for interoperability and standards in these systems? What sorts of hurdles need to be overcome or what constraints are there? Complicated question, but I'll, I'll try to simplify the point that we were trying to make and get to your question, Donna, as far as the hurdles. With different entities right now in the agricultural business, for example, as our discussion on table one was, utilizing different software as an independent vendor or manufacturer, that software may require unique training and may be totally different than another manufacturer or vendor. There's a hurdle there. There's a challenge. One of the things that we talked about is the ability to bring uniformity ultimately maybe to those systems that are used. But the first step would be to get a pipe where all that information could be landed in a place or places of a small number and in those places, the information could be uh, consistently stored or utilized, which would be the first step towards gaining uniformity in the systems itself. Pilots, that's an operational, that's an action item. Yeah. I'm sure you can talk to a lot of people in this room afterwards about starting a pilot like that. Any responses to that? Well, there's no doubt that uh, building out the infrastructure is, is uh, one of the things, but it's also an educational process <clears throat> for design uh, folks. Um, in <clears throat> one of the uh, uh, engineers who was part of the original design team for the iPod, uh, Donald, uh, yeah, Donald Norman, I, I had to look it up to make sure I got the name right, uh, wrote a book which is now standard for architectural and engineering schools across the nation called Design of Everyday Things. One of the things that he, uh, what he was talking about was the simplicity of control. Um, if you want to take an example, try reading your refrigerator manual. The two controls in there seem to be, okay, if I turn it over here, it's going to go colder, doesn't work that way. They're actually interactive and they're not intuitive. In order for, in order for the uniformity of design to be, to be uh, put into place, one of the very first things that has to be done is we need to talk to the populace, the end user, and determine what it is that they need to see. Designing stuff from my standpoint does not help somebody who's out in the field unless I go and talk to them first. So it's an education and it's a collaboration. Further responses to that theme? I want to look at table number three's infrastructure cost and its sustainability. What kind of understandings by the broad public or by key decision makers, what essential understandings have to be adopted in order to address the sustainability and the high cost of infrastructure? 
Anybody else want to give that a try? <laughs> I think key policymakers and lawmakers and, and even the general public needs to understand that that um, you know in, in urban areas it's very easy to have the end user pay the cost of 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 the the service and the the telephone plant and everything that's used to provide the service, but that's not the case in in the rural areas. I mean, you can't you can't just go wireless. And they have to understand that the um, the wireless is based on the the wired um, network underlying um, the you know the entire state, and so it's, that's what's really important to know that 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 universal service funding has to has to remain robust, has to m remain sufficient, um, like just like Senator Roberts was saying, it needs to r remain sufficient. Um, and, and predictable in order for these uh, services to keep our, our rural communities vital. Well put. Any other key understandings, not only for decision makers, but for the broader public as well on the issue of sustainability? Yeah. I think to echo somewhat what Colleen was saying, um, where I think if we understand and accept that we're all in this together as a nation, that there is a difference between the rural uh, areas and the population density and the urban area and population density and therefore the related cost, but we benefit each other as a nation. We need our urban neighbors, they need their rural neighbors. So I think if we look at it in a holistic approach, it perhaps is a little easier to understand, easier to understand that we need to support these things as well. I want to talk about public-private partnerships from table two. I talked about public libraries serving as locations for discussions to take place, that whole working across different sectors. Does that situation, public-private partnerships and public libraries being involved, does that depend upon any other priority that we've heard about being addressed? Does something have to come first? What would have to come first before you would get that? <laughs> well, I think public libraries can serve as the space where those discussions take place, um, but there's gonna have to be members of private business that are interested in initiating those conversations. Um, that's probably gonna have to be the first thing. Somebody's going to have to step up and and be first. Initiative. Do we have any models for that that we could call upon and point to, saying it's happened before? Well, I think, I think that when we look at what we're facing, what we're really focusing on on the education part was the Board of Regents just came out and said that for AP classes at high schools, the advanced placement classes, if the teacher that's teaching those courses does not have a master's in that area of study, so it's not a, a, a master's of education, so a math teacher needs to have a master's in mathematics to be able to teach an advanced placement class at a high school is going to be a game changer in high school education because now we, at Riley County, we have no teachers that are qualified to teach any advanced placement classes. So now everything's going to have to be online. And so what we were driving at on the public-private partnerships, the school districts will buy the hardware. We'll, we'll, we'll pay for that, but we don't have the infrastructure, or we don't have the knowledge base on what it is we need to be doing, how we can get hooked in. We need the, the communications companies in our, that are serving our rural areas to be the private partnerships with the public school systems and supply the information and supply the expertise to us and, and partner with us to enhance the education. That's really what we were kind of driving at. And then utilizing the public libraries potentially as a place to host the public meetings that were outside. That's how those two kind of tied together. Great. Got a response over here? Yeah, 
just for an example, um, we actually, I'm working alone with one of our independents that is also working with a county's, they, the county key anchor institutions formed a group that includes the libraries, hospital clinics, school districts, emergency 911, and li libraries, I'm missing somebody. Anyways, the key, I think it's like 60 some facilities along, uh, among the, the, in the county. They're working with the local telecom and what we're gonna do is we're gonna do an RUS loan um, and the cost feasibility for the loan is gonna be a 20, 20 some year contract with the county to provide the backbone infrastructure for running the initial fiber to those facilities and setting those facilities up. And so there are some examples of stuff. Now this is still in the initial phases of, of working it out, but this initial loan will be cost feasible based upon what the county is giving them as a contract to, to help pay this back. And so there is an example of a uh, public-private partnership. And then in turn, we're also gonna be working with the county groups to work through RUS's telemed and distance learning grants to help provide some of that funding because what they're wanting to do is to include um, the AP classes and those kind of things in their school district. So there are some groups out there that are doing some of these innovative things. Um, they're just working in a more creative way and coming up with cost feasibility on, on, on how they're financing it. And the county was? Yes. I, I don't know what I'm supposed to release to, at oh. this point of who's doing what, so, but there are people out there that are doing it. Table seven. Education opportunities to getting qualified quality employees or providing workforce training. What values in the larger public would resonate with that idea? Education, training opportunities, getting qualified quality employees, workforce training. Well, I think the general consensus was um, getting people to rural America. Uh, it's one like in the military or in universities, you travel, but your intentions are you're gonna go home. But once you're there, you find the quality of life is different. So what is it to get qualified people to come here and then hopefully see the difference of urban versus rural, rural Kansas, or rural America? So some of the larger companies, we could follow that trend, that we go to the, uh, the, the students and we will pay your way, or partially, under contract that once you're through, we guarantee you a job. Uh, and in fact, we're talking about can, can equip here, non-telephone, they, they agree with that too. You know, for welders, Don was talking about the same thing. So it's kind of, you know, you have young people who are, seem to be a little bit lost now that uh, fearful that there actually is a, a true opportunity left in America, which there is. But you could go to them and say, listen, if you want the training in this, field, et cetera, we guarantee you a job when you get through. And it doesn't have to be at a $100,000 four-year deal. It can be at VOTEC, which is just important today. Any further responses or elaborations on that concept? Yeah, yeah I think this is really where it ties in with some of the from the livestock perspective, larger farms that have multiple employees and from a biosecurity standpoint, as many people may darn aware is that like for swine farms, poultry, you know, you know, some of the cattle, we don't like employees to go travel out. I mean, we'd like to keep, you know, from a couple of reasons. One, so they're not around other producers that maybe uh, could bring something back, but also just a cost. It's no different in this meeting. If we were to count the amount of dollars spent today on travel, for an educational meeting like this. And so from a pr producer or ag business perspective to minimize travel costs, but to have good on-farm training where the employees are doing it during the time, we can get way more value using that part of the workday than trying to make people continually travel. It, there is times we need that obviously for the hands-on. There's a lot of value in that, but there's a lot of value that can come directly into some of the local areas for training that can be done during the workday. Um, as part of their job to enhance their skills and take that off the back of the owner who's more maybe more involved with the financial, the business decisions. Um, some of our owners get a little bit detached from the daily production because they're involved with 
all the business aspects, these type of trainings provide big value for those employees. Any further elaboration on that? There's been a lot of talk about education, and it's about education on broadband utilization, education as training for the workforce in broadband, education in applications for the consumers and for young people in how to use broadband to meet their other goals. I want to ask you all how confident you are that you could actually get the education in broadband initiative or concept uh, to gain traction in the next six months. If you were to be confident that you could formulate such a campaign, what might be the first step that you would take? Any ideas? Hit the road? Marketing. And we're, we're providing education now online, and uh, we're providing it globally. But the big thing that we struggle with in rural markets is how do we let people know it's there? And how do we get the word out and market? Uh, we're real good at developing content at the university. We stink at marketing. And so what we've tried to do is find captive audiences um, and groups like National Cattlemen's Beef Association, American Farm Bureau, Kansas Farm Bureau, and have them market to their members our content. And so we make them partners. And so I could see local telecommunication groups, after meeting you all today, I'll probably be sending you some emails, but there are some incredible things that we could do together to reach your customers um, and provide content. I, I think marketing is um, a big problem for a lot of people. Public libraries have the worst marketing campaigns ever, um, but we do have a lot of digital literacy resources, and that is something that, that we are building out now, and um, I don't know of any public library that's not focused on providing that. Um, but like he said, I mean, we're terrible about getting the word out. So if you have any suggestions on that, how we could partner together just for that, um, that would be go a long ways towards getting people the training that they need. <laughs> um, one of the things, well, one of the things we talked about was just getting, as far as even just the telcos, all together to get one marketing campaign and go out to our, you know, the people we can reach. Sometimes we're all doing the same thing to all of our customers, which is great, but we talked about what a great impact we'd have if we all went together and had one brand, one look, one message about what broadband really brings to rural America. So that's an idea. One message, one story. And it has to be done through storytelling, not through data. Um, you got to tell a story if you're going to market what you do and what you need and what you are. And it should be one story no more than three bullets within that story and be told over and over and over again consistently and chronically. In this banner behind me, it's uh, Blue Valley Television. And one thing I was thinking about is um, we've all watched television at some point. Now, with the power of television, you can learn Spanish or you can melt your brain. Most of us use it to melt our brain. You know, I come home at 5 o'clock, turn on the television, and there goes the drool. Um, broadband is exactly the same way. We can use broadband to expand and, and increase our knowledge and increase our learning base or we can use it to check Facebook and Twitter and melt our brains. Uh, education on the proper use of broadband to our younger people and such, just because a three-year-old can use an iPad doesn't mean that they're using it properly or using it in the best possible way. Um, and, and training those, those kids and, and, and older adults and such to use that technology in a proper manner. Further elaborations or even questions? 
I couldn't resist. I have to stand up and make this point. After listening to this most recent discussion, here's what I picked up. We have the source of education from different points of view. We have the means and the capabilities. Every rural telecom in this room can assist with what you, you mentioned, Doctor. This doesn't take months. We can do this now. If anything comes from this meeting, I am so excited at the end of our discussion here to have an actionable item that we can move forward with tomorrow and make it happen and tie our industries together. How exciting. Thank you all for that. That was the segue that I was looking for. You must have just <laughs> intuited it. <laughs> you must have felt the temperature of the crowd. <laughs> Are there, I just have one last question. Were there any priorities that were not addressed, that were left off? Hearing none, I heard some great comments this afternoon, some concrete, doable steps, and a lot of excitement about something that might get revved up immediately. I heard somebody is about to send email. I heard that libraries and dot-com marketers and many telecoms can be in communication with university types to actually formulate a compelling message and narrative. That single message, despite the fact that we all say no one size fits all, that single narrative can be extremely compelling. And I want to thank you all for letting me use this method to try to harvest your ideas. I'm going to pass the mic now. Thank you so much. And all of your questions are going to be saved. Thank you so much. All right. Well, I'd like to take the opportunity one more quick time to recognize all our panelists and speakers we had. Let's give them a round of applause. We appreciate their expertise. And the gentleman that just can't sit down when he's speaking, uh, a lot of you know him, but he, I want to introduce him. He is our... Uh, CEO, General Manager for Blue Valley Telecommunications, Brian Thomason. He and his staff put this all together, and I would like to recognize Brian and all the uh, Blue Valley staff that put this together because there's been a lot of, a lot of hours put together. So let's recognize the staff of Blue Valley. <laughs> but once again, I'd really like to thank all of you for being here today and showing a concern because uh, this is this is the. Uh, very important to all of us, and I think it's our future. So not only in the broadband industry, but uh, all the agriculture industry as well. So uh, we are done a little early, but oh, Angie has something else. I was trying to word it to you, Terry, oh. but <laughs> you didn't get. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, we wanted to make sure to um, give a big shout out to K-State and thank them for all their support and also NTCA and the Smart Rural Community Program. It has been great working with you guys and just pooling all of these resources. It's really exciting. So thank you. Yeah, especially thank you to Jessica for coming all the way out here. We really appreciate it. So uh, anything else we need to discuss before we adjourn? Once again, thank you all for being here and you all travel safely going home.